City Council. Good afternoon, Keelan. Please call the roll. Good afternoon. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Hardesty. Wheeler. Here. Now we're going to hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Portland City Council. City Council is holding hybrid public meetings with in-person attendance in addition to electronic attendance. If you wish to testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance by visiting the council agenda on the council clerk's webpage at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. You may sign up for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. Written testimony may be submitted at CC testimony at Portland, Oregon, Gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so that everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Great, thank you. Uh, first up, Keelan, item number 948. Approve the Cauley Tax Increment Finance District Plan. Colleagues, this is a hearing of the Portland City Council. Today's date is November 9th, 2022. It's a pleasure to be back to discuss the proposed tax increment finance district in the Cauley neighborhood. As a quick reminder, this proposal resulted from several years of exploration work co-led by community partners, Prosper Portland, and the Portland Housing Bureau. In September, Council received an update about this work, how it was initiated, and what the community process looked like over the past four years. We asked questions about what makes this neighborhood in this particular moment in time unique. We were curious about the local demographics and some of the market dynamics. We wanted to better understand how TIF has been used historically and how TIF funds have been used for stabilization projects elsewhere in the city of Portland. We also had a lot of questions about the proposal for this particular TIF district. Those questions were largely around the projected financial impact as well as details of implementation, governance, and accountability. We'll be learning more about the proposed TIF district today, but first I'd like to extend my thanks to program staff as well as community partners for your hard work since that meeting to track down answers to our many questions and share them with commissioners in advance of today's meeting. Thank you. I want to also highlight a few things that stood out to me as I looked over all the information that you shared collectively with all of our offices. Nearly 6,000 new units of affordable housing in 98 buildings have been created in Portland using funding from TIF districts in the last 20 years, with 97% of those units serving households with incomes at or below 60% AMI. In the early days of TIF, a large portion of funds went to transportation and other types of infrastructure. Over the last decade or so, we've changed the way that we've spent our TIF funds, shifting towards more affordable housing and more community-oriented projects, like the June Key Delta Community Center up near Peninsula Park, the Nick Fish Building in Gateway, and the Portland Mercado in the Foster Powell and Lentz neighborhoods. We've also explored new models for how we as a city approach creating TIF districts as well as managing our precious TIF resources. And there's obviously still more that we can learn. This new Cully district, I believe it is an, an exciting example of how through 
authentic partnership and collaboration, we can deliver on equitable economic and housing opportunities for our communities, especially those that are the most vulnerable to displacement, something that is foremost in our minds at this particular moment in history. Today, we'll have a presentation by staff from Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau and community partners on the proposed ordinance. We'll see a map of the area that would be within the boundaries of the TIF district, a list of the types of projects that these funds could potentially be used on, as well as the governance structure for administering the funds moving forward. We're also going to hear from some invited speakers and from members of the public who've registered to testify and have some time for council question and discussions. This is a first reading, so just to be very clear, there will not be any vote on this today. I'll share more information on the next steps after we hear from public testimony. I look forward to hearing more about the proposal from the team, uh, but before we get started, Commissioner Ryan, would you like to make any opening remarks as Housing Commissioner? Well, thank you, Mayor. You just surprised me. Um, actually, I'm um, I'm good. So let's just get started with the great. And I understand Multnomah County Commissioner uh, Sushila Jaipal is here to share some remarks. She needs to be out by two thirty, so I want to give her the opportunity to say a few words before we get into the presentation. Commissioner Jayapal. Uh, the commissioner is online. She's we're getting her. Yeah, no, I understand. Good afternoon. Sorry, it took me a few minutes to get my technology going. Good afternoon, Mayor. Afternoon. And I'm Sheila Jayapal, Multnomah County Commissioner for District Two, uh, and the proposed plan all within my district in Northeast Portland. I have been hearing from community members from the beginning of my term. Uh, community members from the Kali neighborhood as they volunteered hours of their time to create a new type of TIF district. I heard them talk about the desire to maintain the diversity and affordability of their neighborhood while making improvements to support local small businesses and other amenities to help their existing community to thrive. Last month, the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners was joined by Prosper Portland staff, Portland Housing Bureau staff, and an Exploration Leadership Committee member to learn more about the Kali TIF District proposal. <laughs> colleagues on the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners to share our support, our strong support for the proposal before council. My colleagues and I share a sense of excitement about this work, not just because of this new model for using TIF and the emphasis on co-creation with the community, but also because of the effect this will have on the creation of future TIF districts. I don't think it's a secret that past models concentrated power and opportunity in the hands of a few. We <laughs> will put wealth and opportunity in the hands of people who live in the district and want to ensure community members stay in their homes while enjoying thriving businesses and amenities. But one of the tax districts which which will forego revenue to this district, I think the benefits outweigh the tax revenue impact and my colleagues are in full agreement. I want to thank the city, organization partners, and especially the community members and residents for the sustained effort, engagement, and hard work in creating this proposal. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Ryan has a comment. Yeah, I had a chance to reflect a little bit. Uh, I just want to say how much I've appreciated the authentic engagement. And we've had many meetings on this since I've been in office. So I'm really happy that we're here today. I also want to take this moment to go off record, go off the record a bit just to say it's Commissioner Rubio's birthday today. So everyone, <laughs> look at her and say, happy birthday, Commissioner Rubio. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> there, cut that out. Uh, Commissioner Jayapal, thank you very much for joining us today. We, we appreciate it. Uh, so thank you for that. We now have a presentation on this proposal. I'd like to welcome Executive Director of Prosper Portland, Kimberly Branham, to get us started and to introduce other key staff and community members who are joining us today. Welcome, Director Branham. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. It's great to be with you to present about the proposed Cully Tiff District. 
My name, uh, for the record, is Kimberly Branham. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the executive director of Prosper Portland. I'm joined today by several um, partners, Candace Avalos, executive director of Verde, Eddie Martinez, director, uh, district manager of R42nd, and Oscar Arana, community development manager at NEA, as well as interim director of the Portland Housing Bureau, uh, Molly Rogers. The proposal before you today is the product, as has been mentioned, of co-creation between the city and community partners. Those of us at the dais represent a number of people. Um, we're just representatives of a number of people who have invested huge amounts of time, held difficult conversations, and committed to a collaborative approach to be uh, before you today. So I want to just start by personally thanking the Prosper staff, Portland Housing Bureau staff, and every member of the community who worked and dedicated their time, energy, and leadership to this work. So in that spirit of co-creation, we're going to be going back and forth today. So I'm going to hand it over to Candace to talk through the agenda. All right. Thank you, Kimberly, and good afternoon. As Kimberly mentioned, it was incredibly important for us to show up here today together, community and city leadership, to share about this work that began four years ago. We'll kick it off with a little refresher from Eddie Martinez on the Cully Tiff exploration process. Then Molly Rogers and Kimberly Branham will provide more detail on the proposed Tiff district plan itself, what makes it different, as well as as well as its financial implications. And then Oscar Arana will present about the governance charter, accountability, and how the co-creation process will be carried forward into implementation. Then together, Molly and I will wrap up with the next steps and future city council touch points. Do I need to tell someone next uh, yeah, slide next or slide. how are we? <laughs> cool. Thanks. Who's in charge? Cool. Awesome. Oh, and one more, actually. One more slide. Thank you. Okay, so but first, a little grounding about what's similar between this TIF proposal and prior districts. TIF is a proposed tax base funding tool. Project viability and community need is influenced by economic and real estate market trends, and City Council and the Prosper Portland Board retain defined decision making authority and legal liability. But what's different? That's the question we know everyone is asking and what we plan to really focus on today. Um, so as we review the exploration process, the plan itself and the governance charter will start off by highlighting what's different about each. Next slide. Okay. Thank you, Candace. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners and mayor. Uh, thank you again so much for having us back here today. Uh, we're really excited about this. Um, my name is Eddie Martinez. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the district manager for our 42nd Avenue. I'm also a member of the executive, uh, the, the ELC, which stands for Exploratory Leadership Committee, which you'll hear a lot about. Um, so to touch, we really are going to strive to explain what is different about this. It's important to remember that this work originated from the community. We have been using small scale TIF funding through the Neighborhoods Prosperity Networks, or NPNs, for the last 10 years. Uh, we've been building capacity and supporting small local businesses in that time. Uh, but resources are scarce and we really need to scale it up. Um, we asked ourselves, what if a large TIF district scale could be different? What would it look like? We knew that we needed to, to put forward the voices of vulnerable community members. And we knew that we needed to lead with that, with that in mind. And our early outreach needed to prioritize their needs in order to develop a plan by and for what we call priority communities. Next slide, please. Uh, so as we mentioned, the NPNs have been embedded in Coley for the last 10 years. Um, we've had access, again, to very small and very limited amounts of TIF funding for the last 10 years. We've used that money on administrated, to administer small-scale TIF uh, grants to respond to community development and the phys to really ensure the physical needs of small businesses, uh, community plazas, and managing and tenanting affordable commercial spaces. Examples of these would be what we call the Go42 building, 
which is located on Northeast 42nd Avenue in Sumner. It has a beautiful mural of Jackie Robinson. This is what we call the Go42 building. We've, we were able to utilize small TIF dollars to help build out these spaces. And in return, we relied on the strong relationship we had with the property owner to hold an affordable master lease. Where they're, we're then able to pass on those savings to small businesses. Currently, today, there are six businesses thriving in that space, five of which are people of color, and all six are women-owned small businesses. These supports have really been critical to keep Coley small businesses afloat prior and even during the pandemic. But again, they've been very limited. And additional support, affordable housing, to really help stabilize vulnerable community members in Coley so that they not only live and work in Coley, but are also thriving in Coley. Next slide, please. So these are uh, slides that should be very familiar. Um, who is in part of this ELC committee, the Exploratory Leadership Committee? The two NPNs that we've touched on are 42nd Avenue and Coley Boulevard, plus the logos of all the nonprofits in the community, plus a handful of individual community members and our partners at the city with PHB and Prosper Portland. We all make up the ELC. Um, again, very important to understand that four years ago, we as community members and organ community organizations approached Prosper Portland to help us to get involved and to help us explore this. Um, there are many questions uh, we've received from commissioners uh, last time we were here that were great and really resonated with us. Those questions we asked ourselves and collectively as a group, along with our city partners, really thought together um, to really answer those questions to you. Oftentimes, taking those questions back to community members for their own advice. Next slide, please. So the community engagement process has been a very long process um, from both community organizations and city partners. On the green side, you'll see this, uh, the city's community engagement that focused on traditional institutions such as neighborhood prosperity networks. They really help uh, get a broader input from the community. And on the other side, on the purple side, you'll see uh, what we call the, the deeper community place-based uh, engagement work. And what we really mean by that is this work wasn't done by outsiders. We did not hire anybody to come in and do this. We as community organizations who've had relationships for 10 plus years with all different sorts of community members went in and surveyed them, interviewed them, brought them in into focus groups. We really relied on the trust that we have built with them over time to get their feedback. A very big component um, that is really not mentioned here, but it really needs to be understood is that there was a very big educational component to this outreach. Mm -hmm. We really needed to sit and educate our community of what is TIF? What does that mean? How has that tool been used in the past? Let's talk about how it hurt communities in the past and let's figure out if we can move forward with a different kind of tool. And that was a very big part of this component. Um, the ELC's engagement was both critical to drafting the preliminary community report that the ELC issued and formed a foundation of the TIF plan and the report's development. Um, this has been an ongoing work. We're not done with the outreach. We have been going back every step of the way. And from the, the, the border outline to the TIF plan, um, to the primary community language that Director Molly will talk about later, all of it has been vetted 
to the community and changed on behalf of the community with their feedback. Next slide, please. So what did we hear from the community? Again, all these great points that we heard. We heard the desire to ensure current residents benefit. We heard about removing access to barriers, removing barriers to access. We heard about the need to buy land for future affordable projects. More than anything, we heard above, out, above all else, we need to stabilize the community so that our community members, especially those who have been historically displaced, can stay in place and benefit from the growth rather than get pushed out. Next slide, please. So I want to read word for word the original vision. And the original vision was set forth in the community-led primarily report and was carried forward into the district plan and will be carried forward subsequently into the additional action plans of this future TIF district. The community's long-term vision is to transfer Coley into a place that provides a sense of belonging for its residents, particularly for priority communities. This means Coley will have plentiful, safe, affordable housing, thriving black, indigenous, people of color owned businesses, rewarding employment opportunities, safe and accessible transportation opportunities, parks and open spaces, a clean and healthy environment, climate resiliency, with places and programs that reflect the culture and diversity of BIPOC individuals. Thank you, I'll pass it on to Director Kimberly. Thanks, Eddie. All right, next slide, please. Before we dig into the specifics of the plan, um, and the key financial implications. <coughs> Wanted to highlight some of the ways that this is, uh, that, that this plan is different and unique. So as was mentioned, the plan, the report, and the governance charter were all co-created with the Exploration Leadership Committee and it was informed by the engagement that Eddie just talked about. There's an emphasis as well on phasing and ensuring that initial investments are focused on um, stabilization to, um, prepare for potential larger investments that meet the community vision later on in the district. Throughout the plan, you'll see a reference to priority communities, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about what that means, but in this plan, we explicitly describe wh who the intended beneficiaries are for future investments. And last, in the plan's project list, there is an explicit limit on funding for general public infrastructure which is not to say that infrastructure is not important, but it is to say that unless infrastructure is connected to another tax increment finance project that helps directly stabilize priority communities, it's not an eligible investment. And this addresses previous lessons, um, or lessons learned from previous TIF districts where early investments of scale in major infrastructure projects had, an, had the impact of reducing resources available to those important stabilizing investments at the beginning. Next slide, please. All right, so just a quick reminder for the viewing public of how tax increment finance works. Um, Eddie mentioned that TIF is, as a tool, is there's a, some complexity to it. So I'm just gonna uh, refresh um, everybody on some of the key terms. So tax increment financing, it's a financial tool that um, invests property taxes above the current level into a specific geographic area. So as you see here in the graph, at the time the district is created, the frozen base or the total assessed value of all properties in the TIF district when it's formed is determined. This frozen base revenue stream continues to flow to the underlying taxing jurisdiction, so the city, the county, the school state fund, et cetera, for the life of the district. When property tax values increase over time, uh, taxes on this growth are referred to as tax increment. These funds go to Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau um, and are available to finance projects that meet the, um, that, that are within the plan. Once a district is generating significant uh, increment each year, a portion of the increment is shared back 
with affected taxing jurisdictions. And then eventually, once the district has reached maximum indebtedness, um, so the total amount that can be borrowed and is repaid, taxes return to the taxing jurisdiction. All right, next slide, please. All right, also as a refresher, this is where we have current uh, TIF districts in Portland. The map shows those, um, it shows all of the existing districts. Those that are in yellow are active districts. They still have new debt to issue, while those in blue have issued their last debt. Um, and the green, it's a little hard to see, but the green districts, uh, the smaller district, the micro uh, TIF districts are neighborhood prosperity net work districts, and you'll see 42nd and Cully, um, and those sunsetting districts are, will be um, a part of the larger Cully TIF district um, that I'll show you in just a minute. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so here it is. Uh, the TIF district boundaries establish where resources can legally be invested, so it's very important that we are thoughtful about where those uh, boundaries lie. The process for determining the boundary included a number of conversations and iterative discussions with community stakeholders to determine a boundary that aligned with the goals of the plan around residential stabilization and business support. As you see here, the proposed Cully Tiff District includes 1,623 acres and is bounded by 82nd Avenue on the eastern side and 42nd Avenue on the west. The majority of the land is, excuse me, <clears throat> zoned residential in the district, but the two sunsetting neighborhood prosperity network districts, R42 and Cully Boulevard Alliance, capture a number of key commercial properties. And the boundary to the north captures some of the industrial lands along Columbia Vol Boulevard to ensure resources are available to support job retention and expansion opportunities in employment lands. Next slide, please. Molly. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Molly Rogers. I'm the Interim Director of the Housing Bureau. I go by she, her pronouns. I'm here to talk about the district goals, and they are people-centered. They aim to prevent displacement of vulnerable people, communities, businesses, and community-based institutions from Cully. Preserve existing opportunities for affordable housing and economic prosperity activities and create new opportunities for priority communities. We aim to ensure that current residents benefit from investments and neighborhood change and that opportunities for housing and economic prosperity activities will be preserved and expanded for future generations. We want to ensure that priority communities, those that are often most affected by market and displacement pressure play lead roles in guiding decisions and investments and policies that affect them and their communities. We want to develop and inspire a new model for the creation of future TIF districts in Portland and beyond. Look to actively work to remove barriers that include community members from accessing uh, that can preclude uh, members from accessing TIF-funded projects and opportunities such as barriers uh, related to immigration status, credit history, eviction history, and experience of domestic violence. And last but not least, we want to spur innovation to be part of the solutions to climate change initiatives within our TIF projects. Next slide. Kimberly and uh, mentioned earlier that the plan describes priority communities as the intended beneficiaries of the plan. While we don't, generally don't want to read off slides, we think in this case it is important for us to pause and take a moment and understand the weeks and weeks of reflection that the community had around these priority communities to craft this language. Priority communities refers to the intended beneficiaries of the Cully Tift District, African American and black persons, indigenous and Native American persons, persons of color, immigrants and refugees of any legal status, renters, mobile home residents, people with disabilities, low income people, 
houseless people, and other population groups that are systemically vulnerable to exclusion from Cully due to gentrification and displacement. I just want to make a note that we have had asked questions um, along the way around why uh, we did not include <coughs> Latin A or Latinx as part of this definition, particularly because we do know the Cully neighborhood has a considerable Hispanic and Spanish-speaking population. And this was a topic of discussion amongst uh, the community members, and uh, the point of view was that not everyone who speaks Spanish identified as Latinx. And further, there are many white folks who identify as Latinx, but are not systematically vulnerable to displacement. So Spanish-speaking community members are included in this definition under one or more of the following categories, people of color, indigenous, immigrants, refugees, or other population groups systemically vulnerable to exclusion. Next slide. These district priorities will help inform eligible projects. And it's important to highlight here that the use of TIF is still bound by the physical permanent improvements that develop and renovate property within the boundary identified within the plan. So this project list is identifying the what and it is important that the who, which is identified in the priority communities, is closely connected to the what to ensure the vision for the district. So this list of the what are affordable housing, home ownership, home repairs, commercial property acquisition, development and renovation. This could be uh, also examples of this would be mixed use development that combines commercial space with affordable housing including employment of community members and access to high wage employment. Arts, culture, and signage, land acquisition and land banking, especially for properties for future projects, remediation of land for development. Recreational improvements, such as community centers, community gardens and natural areas, athletic facilities and safe space for community gathering, and infrastructure improvements and as Kimberly mentioned, this is an example of a change in focus from previous TIF districts. Although it is an eligible use, it's important to the community that these improvements are linked to projects that stabilize community. Next slide. The TIF plan includes the long-term vision, implementation principles, and the legally allowable menu for future TIF investments. The five-year action plan sets forth a shorter-term impl implementation strategy, project and budget priorities, and measures of success, accountability, and oversight. Okay. I'll back to you, Kimberly. All right, thanks, Molly. Next slide, please. And you can go one more. All right, so I want to talk, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit about the financial implications. Um, and so I'm going to start with maximum indebtedness. Um, so again, this is the amount that can be borrowed over the life of the district. And the proposed maximum indebtedness is $350 million. We anticipate that that'll, it'll take about 30 years, um, plus or minus, to reach the maximum indebtedness. Um, and depending on how many bonds we issue and um, the uh, sort of the financing costs, there will be about $320 million that will be available for affordable housing economic and community development. In alignment with the City of Portland set-aside policy, at least 45% of resources will go to the Portland Housing Bureau for investment in affordable housing. And then between 45 and 55% will go to economic and community development. Um, and so the understanding is that at least 45% will go to economic and community development. And then the 10% difference that's not uh, defined um, will be identified as part of the action plan. So each five-year period would say how that 10% would be programmed. Is it going to go to affordable housing? Will it go to economic and community development? Or a mix of both, depending on community needs um, at that time. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is, there's a lot of information on this slide, but one of the questions that um, council asked is, what can we expect um, through the life of the district? Um, and because we are anticipating this iterative process whereby we make, we create uh, five-year action plans, um, you know, right now we are sort of anticipating um, what it might look like, but wanna be clear that, um, as you're gonna hear from Oscar, that there will be a process um, each five years to really identify the priorities in line with the overall 30-year plan. But this slide shows uh, roughly how much money will be available for investment in the first three five-year periods. So you see about 25 million in years one to five, about 30 million in six to 10, and about 50 million in years 11 to 15. So in the first cycle, we're looking mostly at smaller scale stabilizing grants and loans for priority community residents and businesses that are at risk of displacement. There's also an interest in opportunistic uh, land acquisition for later development. In the second cycle, we'd begin pre-development or development work on acquired properties and continue with the stabilizing grants, loans, and land acquisition. And then in the third cycle, we'd begin to look at significant investments in new development. Next slide, please. So this gives you a, just a, uh, I wanna talk through two projects to give an example of what we might be able to do with the scale of resources that we're talking about. So um, the Portland Mercado uh, is within the Lentz Tax Increment Finance District and with um, just over a million dollars in tax increment finance resources, we were able to leverage, well, Hacienda CDC is the development partner um, and was able to leverage federal grants, foundation loans, and other fundraising in order to deliver um, a community asset that continues to be an example today. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that we might be able to do in the first 10 years with relatively model, uh, modest levels of investment. Um, and I think the other thing to note is just uh, tax increment finance is almost always a gap financing tool. And so it's, um, you know, while we're anticipating investing $350 million over the life of the district, that will be matched, you know, over uh, at, least, <laughs> at least by 350, but probably three, four, or five times that by other resources. Next slide, please. So probably in the 10th to 15th year-ish, we might be looking at a scale of projects like the Nick Fish, which is in the Gateway Tax Increment Finance District um, and was the result of a partnership um, that um, secured seven, uh, nearly $17 million in tax increment finance um, and led to ground floor affordable commercial space as well as a mix of both affordable and workforce um, housing um, at a really key part of Gateway. Next slide, please. All right, so this slide shows a projection of the revenue impact to the city over uh, and other taxing jurisdictions based on the creation of the Cully Tax Increment Finance District over a 36 year period. The total impact here of up to $116 million for the city um, and $9 million for Portland Public Schools um, and overall a total of about $479 million over all of the taxing jurisdictions represents a conservative, which is to say a worst case scenario based on a high level of long-term borrowing. So um, it might be somewhat lower than this, but we wanted to be transparent about what it would look like if we had three major bond issuances. Next slide, please. Putting this financial impact into the context of returning tax increment finance from expiring TIF districts to taxing jurisdictions, what you see looking specifically at the city is that over the next 10 years, approximately $330 million will flow back to the city of Portland. <clears throat> Excuse me. And over the same time period, the forgone revenues related to the Cully TIF district would be about $6.6 .6 million. Next slide, please. With that, I'm passing it to Oscar. Can we go over that one more time for me? I'm yes. not sure if I understand. And I'll, I'll, I'll put my cards on the table. I, I think the CBO has put out some projections too, and if, I feel like their numbers look a little different from yours. But um, why don't we go with, yes. um, why don't we just review the slide one more time? Sure, okay. So um, if we can go back two slides. Okay, so this slide right here shows over the life of the tax increment finance district, um, which we anticipate to be about 36 years, the impact, the total impact of the city of Portland would be about 116 million. Okay. Okay. 
On the next slide, um, it shows what that looks like in the, more, in the near term forecast. So between now and 2031, 32, um, the anticipated impact is about $6.6 .6 million to the city. Uh, the state school fund. Okay, I think I, I'm having problems with the second slide, but why don't we move on and I'll uh, follow up with staff okay. uh, in a different time. Thank you, Commissioner. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Kimberly. Um, good afternoon. I'm Oscar Arana. I'm the Community Development Director at the Native American Youth and Family Center. I use he, him pronouns, and I'll be describing the plan's governance and accountability mechanism. An important document that is paired with the plan is the Cully Tiff District Community Governance Charter. The charter is a key element of the district's long-term success because it outlines how the Cully community and the city staff will collaborate, coordinate, and partner closely with each other. I'll also highlight that the co-creation of the charter is another way how this plan is different from previous TIF districts. This will be the first plan that includes a charter created in partnership with community members and city staff ahead of full adoption by city council. While the Exploration Leadership Committee was developing the document with city staff, we were all aware that few, if any of us, would still be around 20 to 30 years from now to ensure the plan continued to be implemented as originally envisioned. While we've built strong relationships and trust over the last four years, we all recognized that we couldn't just depend on that. Because this is a 30-year plan, we wanted to set strong expectations around co-creation, clarity around roles, processes, as well as accountability and escalation measures for not working in authentic partnership. The Charter is a public commitment to authentic, open, and an equitable public engagement process. Next slide, please. The Community Governance Charter has three major components. The formation of the Community Leadership Committee, which is also known as the CLC, a detailed description of co-creation roles, processes, and expectations, and a clear outline of accountability measures if they become necessary. Next slide. The purpose of the Community Leadership Committee is to advise city future leadership of Prosper Portland and PHB, commissioners in charge, the Portland City Council, and the Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners on the implementation of the TIF plan. The committee will provide essential guidance, public recommendations, and oversight of the implementation of the TIF plan. The CLC will collaborate with city staff to co-create future five-year action plans, which will be a public document presented to city council. This committee will exist for the life of the district and will ensure that priority community voices are centered in guiding the implementation of the plan and holding the city accountable to the goals of the plan. The CLC's recommendations and actions should reflect the needs and priorities of the colleague community, both current and future generations, as described in the TIF plan. It will, meet, it will be made up of 13 committee members who must either live, work, worship, have children enrolled in school, or have been displaced from within the Cully TIF district boundary. The CLC's composition should reflect the socioeconomic, gender, racial, ethnic, culture, cultural, and geographic diversity of the Cully TIF district community. Committee members will represent the interest of priority populations instead of any personal or employer interests. Next slide. This diagram highlights the co-creation process, roles, and responsibilities outlined in the governance charter. In the blue circle uh, represents CLC members who will reflect the needs and priorities of the Cully community and the TIF plan and will make uh, recommendations to the city. In the green circle, uh, we have the city who will, the city staff who will provide technical support and draft uh, documents, ensure proper notice of public meetings, and implement program offerings. 
Both the CLC and city staff will commit to implement the contents of the TIF plan in the spirit of partnership and collaboration. Together, they will co-create recommendations by working through challenges and jointly bringing them to final decision makers. It's important to note that this process doesn't happen in a vacuum. All committee meetings will be open to the public and additional engagement to get broader public input will be conducted as part of action planning. Finally, the purple circle shows the direct line to City Council and Prosper Portland Board who will be trusted to have final say on the recommendations being brought forward by the committee and city staff. Next slide. The goal of co-creation process is to always produce recommendations that are supported in their entirety by the committee, Prosper Portland, and PHB staff. But just in case, the charter outlines processes and escalation paths in case there is ever a disagreement. Possible examples of co-creation breakdowns can include, but are not limited to, the committee being surprised by decisions made by the city, such as investments made outside of an action plan program offering that the committee did not have the opportunity to offer recommendations on, or the city implementing investments not in alignment with the collective plan vision, values, and goals, or not in alignment with decisions adopted through the processes defined in the charter. The committee and the city will jointly present their recommendations. If full support of both the committee and the city cannot be reached, recommendations will make clear which areas have joint support and remaining areas will include both the committee's and the city's recommendations. Each year, the committee will prepare and present a detailed report to city council summarizing the CLC's perspective, concerns, recommendations on the process, and implementation during the previous year. It will include an assessment of how the co-creation framework is working, how it could be improved or strengthened, or even if the collective district should be terminated. Now I'll hand it back to uh, Candice. Great, thank you, Oscar. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> um, we are not done. So that's what it says on the sheet. Um, so on the next slide, I'm going to touch on the next steps and touch points with city council. But in the spirit of highlighting what's different, I want to highlight a few things that, a few things, sorry. <laughs> we are working with Prosper Portland and the Housing Bureau on a community-based staffing proposal to help with engagement, support, and co-coordinating the new community leadership committee and to proactively connect priority community members with TIF resources. We are developing scopes of work and determining what is and isn't TIF eligible, and we may be back to discuss the proposal once that's complete. Second, before we can kick off the inaugural action plan, we need to get the community leadership committee in place. The governance charter spells out the desired qualities of a member of this body, which will be the first joint city Prosper Portland advisory body, and we'll be coming back to the city council to appoint the committee. Those appointments will be critical, and we hope that the council can appoint members who support and align with the desired vision, goals, and principles in the TIF plan. Next slide. All right, so Molly and I are gonna um, tag team this slide and talk about the city council's role in implementation. So in the first blue bubble, you see a community staffing proposal for spring of 2023. So this includes supporting CLC members, connecting priority community members to TIF resources, co-creating scopes of work for community-based staff, and identifying ongoing funding sources for staff. The next phase will include the CLC appointments in summer 2023. I will appoint a slate of 13 committee members, ensure committee members support stabilization goals of the TIF plan, and ensure that members represent the priority community needs. The next phase would be the Cully TIF five-year action plan will be the following year. Identify investment priorities for the first five years of the district. Identify specific projects for investment and funding for non-TIF eligible items. And also identify accountability metrics for the plan priorities. 
And the last purple circle is the annual accountability report in 2024. So that includes an annual report on the status and functioning of the district, as well as identifying challenges, recommend, making recommendations for improvement, and that um, also may include termination of the TIF district. Last slide, the question slide. So with that, we're happy to take any of your questions and we thank you for your time. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions right away? I've got a few just, uh, oh, there goes my glasses. I guess I didn't need them anyway. A um, couple of just uh, brief questions, maybe Kimberly, these, these are for you. So on the financial slides, particularly the one on slide 20, um, could you just give us some example, for example, uh, if you look at the five year and the six through 10 year, it's about $25 million for affordable housing in the first 10 year tranche. Can you give us some idea of what kind of projects you're talking about? How many affordable units could be created at that 60 AMI threshold? 60 AMI um, for 25 million. Let me take a look here. It doesn't have to be exact, but could you just give us some idea of what magnitude we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So right now our subsidy uh, that we put towards affordable housing projects leverages about um, 70 to 60 percent of additional private funds. So the, um, the projects that are restricted at 60 percent AMI, uh, I can anticipate in this particular community we want to focus more on families. Um, and I would see, I would love to see more family size units come um, that are affordable to those residents. Um, and so at our current subsidy caps right now that we put out in our solicitations, it's 150,000 per unit. So that equals roughly about 166 home, new homes that could come from these resources. And uh, the total, uh, if I read your slide correctly, it was about 144 million over 30 years. Is your assumption the same, about 150,000 per unit? Well, we have to obviously account for the um, time value of money. Clearly, yeah. And escalators. Um, so there would be uh, th those components that come in. Obviously, as uh, we, what we have learned with the Portland Housing Bond is we were able to put out 120 million in one year um, and, and get uh, 12 projects underway. So, so there is a, um, hopefully there could be some kind of component where we don't have to have every, every single project in an equal amount each year. We can um, hopefully do some deeper investments um, uh, then that could get more units on the ground as we need to. And, and that 144 over the 30 years, is that the same source that would be used for land banking? Because I, I heard envisioned in this is both land banking and affordable housing. I, are those separate estimates or is that the same pool of money that you're looking at? It would be, it would be separate. So it would be the same, el, el, they're both eligible uses of TIF. Um, and but yes, I would. But they both come out of the 144. Yes, it would have to both come okay, out. Okay, and I, 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 the reason I'm just putting this on the record now is I, I want to set expectations about realistically what we can do with this particular resource. This isn't the only housing resource we have available to the city of Portland, but in terms of the district and the oversight committee, I just want us to be very, very transparent about how much this TIF district would generate and what percentage of the issue it would actually cover because it's not going to cover the whole displacement of That's the district and I want to be very very clear about that up front uh, same with you Kimberly Prosper you've got 30 million that you projected over the first 10 years around economic development what sort of priorities do you see leading with over those 10 years and you, you mentioned Mercado is sort of yeah. one Great question. Very there. successful model that we all refer to frequently, yeah. but w what else beyond a Mercado? What else could we be doing with those resources? Great question, Commissioner. So I'm sorry, Mayor. So um, the um, Ted is fine. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I apologize. Um, so I think that there are a couple of things that we could do that we will likely do. So um, continue to, or we would provide things like our prosperity investment program grants um, that are, is our most popular tool. Um, it used to be the storefront improvement tool and then we now um, have resources that can be used for interior improvements as well. Um, but this helps stabilize businesses um, and so that would be a significant priority. Um, I can imagine that community livability grants which support non 
nonprofit organizations in their physical improvements and can be invested up to about $300,000 um, would be a community development priority. Um, but then we will also have resources for larger scale improvements um, that you could imagine would be uh, through loans um, and other public-private partnerships. And you know, the Mercado is a, it's a great example, but it does show that if you have a creative development partner, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, that um, you know, even modest resources and TIF can have significant sort of outsized um, impact. And I think partly that's sometimes because having an investment from the city can indicate um, confidence, and so other resources, private financing, foundations, et cetera, can follow because there's a sense that this is a priority. Um, and so, you know, I think it will be modest, and I appreciate the, the reminder that this is not going to solve everything, but I do think that um, you'll be able to see the impact in that first five to 10 years. Good, and, and we heard from our community partners the, the need they have, and I clearly understand it, to be involved in yeah. Uh, the ongoing operations of the TIF district. Do we have other examples in other TIF districts, Lentz or anywhere else, where we use public resources to support the community involvement in the district? Or, well, is, or can, is this a new I model? Can think, yeah, I can think at? of two two models. Um, so certainly the neighborhood prosperity, I think you know we're, we're really scaling up the neighborhood prosperity network mm. efforts. Okay. Um, and that has been, um, you know, the the revenue sharing that the city allocated has helped with uh, supporting district managers and the operations. Um, city general fund has supported that as well. But we've also um, deployed TIF within those districts, and those have been community-led, certainly. Um, and then I think within uh, North Northeast, both Portland Housing Bureau and Prosper Portland have engaged with community partners in a different way to ensure that resources, whether they are um, designed to support individual homeowners or businesses that you have trusted community-based organizations that are engaging directly. And so tax increment finance has been used to do that work um, in, those, in those geographies. Good, and then just one final question. Um, so we hired a consultant to look at the recovery post-pandemic in our various neighborhood business districts. And Coley, I believe, actually did pretty well in that study, didn't it? That's true, Mayor. And um, what we noticed, so Eco Northwest did an analysis, and it showed that Cully, um, that the Cully area, and 42nd in particular, was exceeding the economic indicators of many other areas in our city. Um, and we can think very positively about that. That's good for our businesses. Um, but it also potentially is an indicator that gentrification is coming. We saw one of the single largest uh, increases in home uh, value price between 20 and 21 um, in the city in the Coley neighborhood. So I think we feel like um, while the success can be looked at as a good thing um, that we've seen this before in other areas and so we know what uh, market pressure means and so now is a really important time to make these kinds of stabilizing investments very good thank, thank you, you. I, I appreciate it can anybody I, else can i add oh, yeah, a little bit yeah, more Eddie, from the perspective of like being on the ground during the pandemic when the pandemic started um and and why maybe uh r42 avenue had has thrived it really is the relationships we had individually, not with just business owners, but with commercial property owners. We were able to be on the forefront when the federal dollars came out. And we really encouraged all of our businesses to access those funds. Um, technical assistant who waited until eight o'clock with a Spanish speaking uh, business owner so that they could fill out the form after hours. We, we did all that we could and on top of that, community members really came together to support um, these, these small businesses in times of need. We still ended up losing one. We lost a business because of the pandemic. They just could not afford to be there anymore. But all the other ones really did thrive. Um, I just wanted to make sure I share that. There are lots of components to, to why the success, but it really is the relationships that the community members have and that we have with, with everybody. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you all for your presentation. Uh, I don't see if any I could other... just add one yeah. thing to that as well, because we talked a little bit about leverage and leveraging TIF dollars. So I think one of the reasons why 
you know, we were able to do, uh, provide that support to the businesses and why Kali sort of uh, did better, Kali businesses did better during the pandemic is not only did we use some of the TIF funds that uh, the Kali Boulevard Alliance still had uh, available, but um, through the partnerships that we had with R42, NEA, some of our foundation, philanthropic support, Prosper Portland support city, we were able to deploy, you know, over a million dollars right into uh, businesses in the Colleen neighborhood. So I think that plus paired with technical assistance, being able to help businesses apply for even unemployment or the PPP loan, uh, all of that uh, is what led to the success. Um, so again, we talked about leverage. That's, that's how we were able to leverage TIFF. Thank you, Dan. Did you have Commissioner Yeah, I Ryan? thought it'd be great to just stick testimony before we ask more questions. Uh, sure. How many people do we have? Uh, first of all, Kimberly, did, did we get all the invited testimony, or is there more invited testimony? Um, uh, you mean at the dais right now, or no? Uh, you you we had have mentioned earlier that there was invited testimony. Yes, we have invited Jayapal. testimony. Is there, so there is additional? Additional invited. Do you want oh. to in, call those individuals up Should first before we get to public testimony? Yeah, yeah let's okay. go for that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Stay around. Thank you all for your presentation. Yeah, I always have more questions after I listen to the district. Kimberly, were you going to introduce the oh, public? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know who's invited, so I'm counting on you. So if, if you signed up, um, we'll get to you next. If you've signed up for testimony, if Kimberly invited you, then you're invited testimony. And I, I don't know who's invited and who is not. You know what? Go. Why don't you know? I'm inviting you. Please have a seat. Thank you, Mayor. And just name for the record, please. Annette Pronk. Thank you, Annette. Welcome. And you're also invited. Have a seat. We're going to get to everybody. <laughs> Please. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, commissioners. A special shout out to Commissioner Rubio. May your new year be blessed with prosperity and belly laughs. Um, hello, my name is Annette Pronk, and Cully has been my home for the last 14 years. The things that this Cully uh, TIF district can help accomplish are personal for me. I came to live in Cully through a low income ownership, home ownership opportunity. Um, as a renter, I had moved eight times before finding <coughs> stable housing for myself and my then school aged son. Um, I'm proud to have raised him in the heart of Cully, just off the main Killingsworth through fair, um, right near Cully Boulevard. Having stable housing opened my capacity to be able to be involved in my community in many ways that I hadn't been able to before. I have built relationships here in Cully. I have shared food and meals and participated in community organizing leading to things such as the demolition of the infamous Sugar Shack Strip Club and the rise of new affordable homes. Um, I've become an active member of the Cully Association of Neighbors, which then led me to becoming a board member. Um, Connecting with the organizations that are part of Living Cully Coalition led me to become a uh, Verde board member. And while I am no longer serving on the CAN or the Verde boards, I now have a full-time job working for Habitat for Humanity Portland Region. Great. At face value, that is all great and the testimony to what housing stability can do but what it represents is greater. The investment that was made in me by helping me to have stable housing was an investment in the entire community. Doing all these things 
with and for my community represents the ripple effect that just one household can have. This stabilization-focused TIF plan will help many more people and families. These priority groups will gain greater capacity to show up for their community as well. I worry that investments that help one household won't help future generations of the Cully residents. I value this plan because it includes goals and prior priorities that help make sure that investments don't disappear in the future. Community knows what community needs, and this TIF plan includes these needs, including the need for ongoing community involvement in the co-creation of the action plans and other aspects of the implementation. I strongly support this community-led proposal for a new kind of district in the Cully neighborhood. And in closing, I'd like to add that it is my greatest hope for the mothers of the Cully neighborhood to be able to raise their children in this neighborhood and to watch their children prosper and they themselves raise their families in the Cully neighborhood. That to me is what creates stable, safe communities when neighbors know each other and can help each other. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annette. Thanks for your work at Habitat for Humanity. We all appreciate it. And I did get a list. Uh, we have uh, the invited testimony is A. Sangasi, uh, who's the owner of a, a, a Cully Central, which is a small business. Uh, Gary Hollins, who's the uh, vice chair of the Portland Public School Board of Education, and Tracy Wells Bryant. Um, so th those are our invited testimony. Welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Oh, nice to be invited. Um, just want to say uh, thank commissioners um, and mayor for uh, entertaining this uh, Cully Tiff project. Um, I'm going to kind of be short because um, I know you know folks can get long-winded up, up at the uh, microphone. So what I really want to say is I want to ask, for, of course, for your support of this TIF district. Um, when I first, um, I came on late in the game in the TIF district process, and when I first heard about it, I was kind of weary. Um, because if you look at other districts and the effects that it had, um, it really wasn't favorable for, you know, our minorities and, and women and stuff like that. So, um, but as I got engaged into more of this um, TIF district conversation, um, the intentionality of the priority communities really is what turned it, turned it around for me. Um, when you have intentionality um, and prioritizing um, groups, um, then, the North Star for things that go, move forward within this is geared towards that. And that's what was really um, impressive for me. Um, the fact that I've lived in the Cully neighborhood for over 40 years um, and seeing the, and I mentioned this before, you know, seeing the skyrocketing house prices. Um, my dad's, when I moved over there, I was going to regular middle school, houses was $35,000. Uh, that same house right now is almost $500,000. And so I've seen the cost escalations of the, of the property over there. And you know, with this district, even though it's not gonna solve the problem, um, it will help stabilize um, the community that has been right right now for gentrification. Um, and, and with those TIF dollars, we can bring some kind of stabilization um, to that area, um, that area that has been neglected for years. Um, you know, it was one of the last, uh, community that was annexed into Portland. You know, we still don't have city streets, uh, curbs, things like that. So this investment um, in this community um, is greatly needed and, and appreciated. Um, and so I just wanted to um, just ask you guys for your support um, and knowing that the investment that can come out of this is gonna be far greater than the amount of money that is getting invested into it. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate your being here, both of you. Gary and Tracy? Tracy's online. Online. Hi, Tracy. Hi, welcome everyone. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Tracy Wells Bryant, um, pronouns she, her, and her, uh, she, her, and hers. And I um, 
presently serve with the shared oversight committee with our 42nd Avenue and Cully Boulevard Alliance. Prior to that, I was just part of the our 42nd Avenue steering committee. Currently, I work in the uh, Cully district. I'm a training and education specialist with Portland Community College Opportunity Centers. I'm primarily stationed at the Metro location on 42nd and King, <laughs> which is located right in the Cully uh, district. For over tw 20 years, I would say I have more so served these priority communities as I would say more ed equity educator and career activist, more so than anything, connecting uh, these priority groups to career resources, educational opportunities, and vital career source resources to get their career and educational plans off of the ground. Um, Working with this very dedicated group and this oversight committee, as some of the others have said, we have um, been very dedicated, very invested, and we've leaned in with a lot of intentionality um, and have accepted many challenges head on, but we've um, we put our ear against the chest of the community, okay? And we really focused hard on hearing and then um, having these very complex conversations on a real grassroots level with our community. We've strived hard, and I believe to the best of our ability to capture and collect uh, the community historic and present voices and experiences of those that live, work, and play in this district. And then along with that, of course, being able to rethink and reshape how we can do things differently you know, how can we create greater access, greater equity and inclusion as it relates to business and economic development and opportunities? Um, I would say I'm most passionate about, and I haven't been, I've been very transparent and very open and uh, open about this, um, acknowledging the past harms of some of the renewal plans that have moved forward, um, which have not served the black community well, as we well know. Um, it's imposed a lot of very negative and unfortunately traumatic even and residual traumatic impacts on black folks that live in Portland, Oregon. Um, I have seen neighborhoods um, literally divided by new developments and uh, poor transit decisions along with other um, high level business and economic decisions. And I've seen these communities being left um, broken, displaced, and feeling disconnected from everything that's been very familiar, everything that's been very comfortable for them and considered home. And in many cases, those things um, that have connected them to a sense of community identity. So, um, and then the conversations I'm having now, even in the community, there's a lot of anxiety still even right now over this plan. You know, people still have some concerns, but I believe and we believe that this TIF district is different because we are going to use the same tools that have harmed to repair and to restore and stabilize and develop and hopefully sustain a healthy, inclusive and thriving community. I also believe this TIF district is different because um, it's been a, a, a ground up approach, not just a community driven approach, but a bottom up approach, meaning, um, as we said, the decisions have been made as well, meaning as some of them have been, um, that what we thought was best for communities, okay? And so, however, today we have an opportunity to really examine and take the necessary strides to action that will help us um, maybe not be the end all be all cure all, but we know it's a step in the right direction to, to redirect those harms and to hopefully move forward and allow the people who live and work and play and worship here to be part of the change in a real sustainable way in the own communities where they live. So I just wanna say that across our nation, our world, our city, our state, we're in some pretty big days. And it's my hope that there will be a new day. Okay, so please, we appreciate your support. Thank you for taking this time to listen and hopefully embrace this opportunity to be, do some groundbreaking transformative work for this community and district. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. We appreciate your being here. And uh, last of our invited guests is a Sam Gessi. Welcome, also online. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Com Commissioners, for allowing me to share my testimony regarding the proposed TIF district. 
My name is A. Sangasi. I own Coley Central. I run the Lao Street Food Restaurant and Bar there. As an active Coley business owner, I want to express my full support for the proposed community-led development district. I have witnessed firsthand in what the community-led development district has done for my small business. I've owned Coley Central for almost five years now and believe the proposed TIF district will best support a community that um, is designed to put the residents first and has a very strong equity focus. As someone who has interacted with both Coley Boulevard Alliance and our 42nd Avenue, I have been able to benefit what small scale community led economic, economic development can do for this community and hope to build on this success moving forward. We opened our doors in 2018, replacing the Shady Lady, which is known as an infamous business that closed after many incidents with law enforcement. We built our business focusing on being part of the community as a family friendly gathering place. As a restaurant in this industry during this tough time, we have faced many issues and are still facing them today. If we had not received the technical, business, and financial support from Coley Boulevard Alliance and Prosper Portland, I don't think we would be here today. First, we struggled to keep the property that we worked so hard to clean up due to a, a clause in our lease. Coley Boulevard Alliance um, and Prosper Portland staff connected with us um, with a private investor to help us um, secure financing for our property. The sale um, closed on July 2nd of 2020 in the heart of the pandemic. And then unfortunately, a day after the sale was closed, we had a major kitchen fire, which shut us down for almost the summer. And then once again, we were supported by Coley Boulevard Alliance and Prosper staff. They were able to help us secure over $25,000 in support from private foundations to rebuild and reopen in just two months time. We are grateful for the support that was extended to us, both technical and financial. We hope to remain in this community serving the neighborhood for many more years to come. I believe the proposed TIF district will help us tremendously to do so in, in providing us that support that we need. As a small business, all the um, network relationship that Coley Business Alliance and Prosper has connected us with, we would have never in, in our business time ever know where to go, what to do if we didn't have that support. So I fully support this TIF, proposed TIF plan. Thank you. Thank Great. you for your time. Yeah, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. All right, that concludes the invited testimony. Now I'll ask the council clerk to call the names of those who registered to testify. We thank you for doing so. If you're in the city council chambers today, please come take a seat up here when your name is called. If you're joining remotely, please speak in the order that your names are called by the council clerk, Keelan. As a reminder, each person has three minutes. Please state your name for the record. And with that, I'll turn it over to Keelan. Thank you, Mayor. First up, we have William Francis online. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to share my testimony today in support of the Coley TIF District Project. My name is William Francis. I use he him pronouns. I've been involved in the Coley TIF Project in two distinct capacities over the past couple of years doing face-to-face -face interviews with the houses community and Cully, participating uh, and participating in the project's exploration leadership community, uh, the ELC. I've supported this project both as a volunteer and as part of my practicum for my master's in social work program at PSU, where I concentrated in macro social work. Um, if I'm to pull one consistent message from the interviews I conducted with houseless folk, it's that they first and foremost are looking for ways to get their basic human needs met. But beyond that, houseless people want to be part of a neighborhood community. Out of these conversations, the potential TIF project list now includes things like public bathrooms, showers, gathering places where houseless people can feel like human beings and be respected as members of the neighborhood. Affordable housing is great, but affordable is relative as all houseless people I interviewed highlighted. 
This project is evidence of a collaborative effort between community organizers, community member voice, and city staff. The community engagement community found that housed community members want to be part of the solution for the houseless situation in Portland. Community members want to help fellow human beings living in their neighborhood have their basic uh, human needs met. And both housed and unhoused community members want to see built spaces that provide opportunities to socialize with each other. The government's charter is also informed by the feedback we received from uh, houseless community members. While we probably cannot accommodate every need of every housed pers unhoused person and colleague, we surely can do better than spending our time and money building intentionally hostile environments for human beings. I believe the project as it stands is a step in the right direction towards supporting the houseless community and doing it in a way that feels right to, the, uh, to house people as well. The houseless situation is likely not going away anytime soon, but in the meantime, we have to do something at the local level. We can choose to spend money on pushing houseless people away from our site corralling them, or we can spend the money on building spaces that all community members agree upon and that will also help meet some fraction of the basic needs of, uh, of houseless people. Um, so touching on the governance charter that was developed through the Exploration Community uh, Committee's work, um, it was evident to me that everybody on that committee truly wants to ensure community voice is included on an ongoing basis and to allow that community voice to lead the work in an even more even more impactful and meaningful way than previous TIF funded projects. Um, I'll wrap up with my remaining time um, just saying that city government and private sector are great at talking about equity and social justice these days and while some good work has been done there's still a lot of a room for improvement when it comes to actually doing the equity work on the ground level. This project is an example of coming together to do the equity work. Please give it a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have David Sweet, followed by Clarence Larkins here in Chambers. Welcome. Why don't you go ahead? Go ahead, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is David Sweet, and I am really excited to be here today because this is the culmination of more than four years of work by many people. <clears throat> My neighbors in Cully are place-based community organizations and dozens of city staff. When I became involved with this project in 2018, I could see my neighborhood losing our cherished diversity to economic forces beyond our control. I also saw a community fighting back to retain that diversity. With broad community support and our place-based community organizations, we purchased and closed the Sugar Shack Strip Club and will soon celebrate the opening of 142 affordable apartments on that site. With the city's help, we saved the oak leaf and changed the rules for all mobile home parks so they can't be redeveloped as unaffordable housing. We've created opportunities for Cully residents to start and expand businesses while improving the vitality of 42nd Avenue and Cully Boulevard. We built Thomas Cully Park. We raised $150,000 to provide rent relief in the first years of the pandemic. We've done all this and much more, and it's not enough. Every time a property changes hands in Cully, it becomes unaffordable for low-income people. It's not going to be affordable ever again. If things don't change, we're going to lose the fight, and that's where we got the idea that we could use tax increment financing in a way that's never been done before. Why, we ask, can't we use TIF money to support the very people who have always been displaced by urban renewal areas in the past? Over the past four years, our community, working with city staff, has co-created a plan and a governance structure that we feel confident will accomplish that. Not only that, but we created a template for future TIF districts 
as Commissioner Jayapal pointed out, because the sins of urban renewal should never be repeated. You hold the future of my neighborhood in your hands today. You can give us a chance to make Cully a place where low-income people, people of color, indigenous and tribal people, renters and mobile home residents can thrive and prosper into the future. Please give us that chance. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Clarence Larkins, and uh, I'm a child of God who is called to serve. I'm here to acknowledge my people and community as a black American man. I am a part, I am uh, as, as part as, uh, I, I'm advocating for a part for the TIF plan. Uh, I'm advocating for the Portland, Portland, Oregon Black Family Village as part of the TIF plan, AKA known as Portland Black Family Village. I've lived in Northeast Portland for 58 years. I've been a taxpayer property owner for 49 years. My wife and I have been property, property and business owners in Cully for 25 years. As president of the 42nd Avenue Business Association, I supported the NPI plan 10 years ago. I'm also president and founder of Straight Path Inc., a nonprofit that helped low-income people and others with criminal records and other barriers to employment to find jobs. I'm the only African-American in Cully that have a 501c3 nonprofit. <clears throat> I serve my community because I love my community. I also believe that black life matters. There's no other people that have experienced displacement more than black people in Cully. Hacienda, Nea, PCC, Habitat, Iowa 42nd, and private builders are all building affordable housing in Cully. And we also have a new high school, De La Salle in the community, and there's also Meek High School. Where will the families gather and grow in Cully? We need P.O. Black Family Village. Please help us to reclaim the Adams property that has been vacant since 2006. Of the first 12 presidents of the United States, only two never owned slaves, John Adams and the second president of the United States, <clears throat> and his son, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States. When the school opened in 1969, they took 48% of the black students from Jefferson High School, 2% of the black students from Grand High School, and 1% of the black students from Madison High School. So there is a lot of black history in that property, and a lot of black history and black heroes in Portland, Oregon. Please uh, help us with the TIF district, and so we can, and, and to get all, Part of the $350 million can be used to honor and give recognition to the black people in Cully by building a P.O. Black Family Village that is focused on education, jobs, and recreation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, we have Christopher Brown online. Welcome, Christopher. Christopher, you're muted. Hello. There we go. Hello, yes. I I'm not really opposed to this TIF, um, but it's going to create a large and diverse neighborhood in, in the Koei area, but it will be dependent for the rest of its life on the city funds to keep it alive, like all nonprofit things. It will be creating a large community. And the TIF says, it says, in it, it, in the, it says TIF investments should be focused on projects that are not likely to be funded by other sources, uh, like the city. And this is going to double the population of Cully. With this, this plan could double the population of Cully. Of Cully. And at the beginning of this plan, it says that the city has ignored as far as improvements go for the last 20 years. And I'm wondering if the city is going to, with this doubling of population, is going to step up their commitment to infrastructure in Cully, the Cully neighborhood. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Next up, we have uh, Mary Benson. Is Mary Benson here? No. Uh, followed by Robert Butler. Is Robert on the line? Yes. Okay. There he is. Robert, you're muted. Okay, I unmuted. Am I? Yep, we hear you, Robert. You got me? <laughs> yep, welcome. Okay. Well, big day in the city, a lot of change. But I'm going to take you back to a, hopefully a bigger picture. But my first feeling is what size is Cully? I mean, what city would we say Cully is? Size of? And I'm trying to think, and I'm only thinking maybe the city of Yamhill, Oregon or something. But Portland's a big city, so why should we spend $300 million on this tiny little burg for Portland that has such big responsibilities? Now I'm going to talk to you about tax increment financing. One third of all the tax increment funding we get is supposed to go through K-12 through education, state law, okay? One third of all property taxes goes through. K through 12 education, Salem, Oregon. Now, what you wanna do is borrow $300 million from the public here. And what you wanna do in the process is divert $100 million, that's one third, away from K through 12 education. <coughs> this is greed, greed and unfair to millions of family, border to border, state of Oregon. So shame on us if you think this is fair to Oregon to, to take their money from their children. Their children in 30 years will have not as good an education as they could have had because we stole their money. Then they will be adults and their children will also be stolen from their good education 30 years. Okay, so let's get back. Why $300 million for, for Cully? Why? Now, our total debt right now for the whole city is $1 billion. <coughs> and you want a third more for Cully? So please, be more rational. Now we're going to talk about what this does. You're taking money away from K-12, through border to border, state of Oregon. And what else are you doing? You're taking away money that would go to police, human services, fire, streets. You're defunding because you're diverting this money. You're defunding the police. You're defunding human services. And, and think about it. Why are you so much smarter than the city of Portland of what you need? You just said you want to spend money on what the city doesn't want to spend money on. Well, maybe there's a reason for that. And maybe you don't deserve $300 million. So I would suggest you scale that way back and give us a reason why you have a new scale for it. If, in fact, your conscience can live with the fact that you're going to steal from millions of families all over Oregon because of their K-12 through losses. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Next up, we have Kete Kapua. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh. All right. Greetings. I am Kete Kapuya, Program Specialist uh, with Monoma County Health Department, Racial and Ethnic uh, Approaches to Community Health Program Reach. Uh, the Monoma County Reach Program, along with Monoma County Health Department, are pleased to support dis, uh, TIF District in Coley uh, presented today. Our work occurs in partnership with stakeholders, um, including some colleagues that we have, uh, Allergia um, Flex, Living Black uh, that worked for Living Black uh, Coley. We combine public uh, health interventions with community wisdom and leverage community-based part uh, participatory approaches to identity, um, to identify, design, implement communications, policy system, environmental improvements. 
um, we now, through a series of community needs assessments, that despise the social and cultural assets, cultural, uh, Coley suffers from many disparities. Uh, residents have greater access to alcohol and tobacco than they do grocery stores, uh, parks, and sidewalks. Um, there is also an increased presence of marketing and advertising for alcohol and tobacco products throughout the neighborhood. The Coley TIF district uh, could provide opportunities to work collaboratively with a diverse community to our spur economic, uh, cultural, health, environmental, and social benefits for Coley residents, uh, particularly low income, black, and other people of color, residents through job tra training, job opportunities, business, contracting opportunities, youth empowerment, and community building. Uh, these concepts uh, aligns with the public health. Um, please allow me to share with you. First, we know when we look at the leading causes of death and many complex factors influence health disparities. These factors are often called social determinants of health and many include um, which people play, pray, worship, shop, and work. Uh, additional factors like economic stability, education, access, and work. Um, or the quality, social and community connection, sorry, healthcare access and quality, food and nutrition security, um, housing affordability, neighborhoods and built environment determine the quality of life and health outcomes of our communities. Secondly, uh, we are interested in the Coley TIF uh, district because of the uh, demographics of Coley. It's social and economic diverse, uh, 45, 5% of residents represent communities of color compared to 29% uh, city-wise. And I'll just go down since I have 14 seconds. Um, I just wanted to come here and represent on behalf of REACH, uh, just letting you know that we support um, this task. And thank you again, City of Portland, uh, Prosper Portland, Living Coley, NEA Coley, Associations of Neighborhood, Living Black Coley, and all partners in, uh, all support supporters in partnership. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. Thanks for your good work at Multnomah County. Yes. Uh, next up, we have Chach Hart online. Welcome. Hi, my name is Chach Hart, and I am a resident at Arbor Mobile Home Park in the Cully neighborhood. And I also worked on the community engagement process. Um, for the Collective District, and I currently still work with the Exploration Leadership Committee. Part of my job on the Community Engagement Committee was to work with my direct neighbors here at Arbor Mobile Home Park, but also the other residents at other mobile home parks in the neighborhood. There's four in the neighborhood. There's hundreds of units of mobile home residents in the neighborhood to find out what they wanted for their neighborhood. So the plan that's put before you has direct input from some of some of the neighborhood's poorest residents and most disadvantaged in the neighborhoods with the way that landlords um, treat mobile home residents and the destabilization that residents face. The parks are in shambles with um, abandoned units homes that are unsafe and unfit for the people who live in them with no with no class status to be able to better their situation or to purchase even like a safer mobile home for them. And I just wanna really encourage you guys to consider that some of this neighborhood is pretty, pretty bad off and could really use this funds to stabilize the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, we appreciate your testimony. And that completes testimony. All right, very good. Thank you everyone for your testimony today on the new proposed Cully TIF district. Colleagues, any additional questions or discussion? Uh, Commissioner Rubio, I see your hand raised. I just have more of a com comment I wanna make. Um, I just wanted to thank you know all the presenters, Oscar, Candace, Eddie, um, Director Branham um, and Director Rogers uh, for the presentation. It was really insightful and it, I think you really answered a lot of the questions that we had the last time we were here uh, before council about the what the financial structure was for the district. Um, and also, I, I, you know, the, the testimony today I felt was really compelling. 
And uh, for the most part, it reveals uh, to me the support that really exists in the local community for designing this in the right way. And also with reflections um, and uh, a lot of consideration about the lessons learned from past urban renewal um, efforts in the community. Um, and I also have heard, you know, he hearing some folks saying that they're not in support of, about this. Um, and to that, I, I, about fairness and, and what I just wanna express to this is my view that it's not only fair, it's equitable and it's really long overdue in this community. Um, particularly a community that has a long history of di having diverse communities um, in it, including a significant presence of Latine, Black, Indigenous, and others. Um, I've been watching this project take place from even before my time here on council, so it's been really exciting to see how uh, it's uh, each, you know, each year it's coming stronger and stronger into alignment together um, with with community coming together and bringing forward this new uh, this new model and this new way of doing that. And that that change, the new ways, just makes all the difference to me personally. So I um, want to just appreciate all the work that you put into this, um, both Prosper staff and the community, and wanted to acknowledge all the organizations that are participating in the ELC. Thank you so much for each of you for your leadership and for staying at the table to develop this new way of doing something in our city. So look forward to um, the project, continuing to support the project as it unfolds and also seeing how these investments really strengthen the community. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. <clears throat> I'm gonna echo some of Commissioner Rubio's comments. I've had conversations with some of you prior to this, but the way that you brought the testimony forward today um, from the invited testimony to the testimony from the community was so, uh, it was really clear that you've been building relationships for some time. This didn't feel like it was uh, put together quickly. And so I just wanna say, I've listened to a lot of testimony the last two years, and I wanna applaud you for how thorough it was, how um, diverse it was, and I mean from different communities, different perspectives, but all of you are aligned and relationships move at the speed of trust and clearly you've been building deep relationships on this for some time. As I, as I think about this, because the concerns that were brought up, not from the testimony that was against it, it's more about how do we ensure that the marketplace won't do what the market does and what are our thresholds? What are our, how do we know when someone's being displaced? What, what's our, what's our, um, boots on the ground, data collections to know when that's occurring. You don't have to all answer this today. I know that it, it's making your head hurt as well, but it's like, how are we going to really manifest this? And that's one. And then two is the, you wanna make sure that we have all the right people on the, um, what's it called, the community governance board. What's the name of the next? Committee. Say it again, Oscar. Oscar just said community leadership committee, right. And so we're gonna make, you know, the council make appointments magically. We're depending on you to give us really good suggestions for that, okay? I, I, I know all of, many of you, but I wanna know who you know and how that can be delivered. So just know that that's also on you to keep building this from the bottom up. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Um, and then Prosper and the Housing Bureau, I wanna make sure that we have more thorough dialogue about how we will do this differently. We have some great aspirational goals, but it's gonna make it, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to really go against the headwinds that's called the market to make sure that we actualize this promise. And you know, when you see things that say we won't really know sometimes for 30 years, okay, I'm not gonna be here, um, duh. And so you just wanna make sure why you're in this position at this time, you're asking these type of questions so that we can build these safeguards. Does that make sense? Does anyone want to add to that, or is it okay just to have it in the record, and we know that we can have continuous dialogue about that? It's on you. You guys are building this, right, from the community. All right, so Prosper and Housing Bureau will have follow-up conversations on this from the people of the community that are, going to help you, that are going to help us do this. All right, good. Everyone is so energetic today. Must have been a big <laughs> night last night. <laughs> Great, well thank you. Uh, I'm obviously uh, deeply impressed with the level of partnership and collaboration and I particularly am grateful for the community's multi-year commitment leading this process as Commissioner Ryan has just indicated 
and your continued efforts to elevate the voices of those who are not always heard and who are the most vulnerable to displacement in our community. Uh, a sincere thank you for the great presentation as well as a fantastic discussion. In the interest of time, I'm going to hold off on uh, the list of thank yous until our actual vote next week, but I do want to acknowledge the incredible amount of staff time and community time that's gone into this work. It could not and it would not have happened without each of you putting a tremendous amount of your personal energy into this. So I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. So this item moves on to a second reading on November 16th. Keelan, is there a time certain available on the agenda on November 16th? We are holding 945 for this Okay, item. so uh, this will move to a second reading on November 16th at 9.45 a.m. time certain. Uh, however, this could go on to the regular agenda if there's no outstanding questions from council. But let's just plan on the 945 time certain on November 16th. Uh, so it's moved to second reading. And with that, let's take a break here uh, and give everybody uh, a break before we get into our next set of items. Uh, it is now a quarter to four. Why don't we reconvene at five minutes to four? We are in recess. Recording stop.
Keelan, could you please read item 949950 and 951 together, please? Sorry, lost my place. Okay, here we go. Uh, adopt City of Portland 2021 Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan, also known as the Mitigation Action Plan, which describes natural hazards in Portland, their potential impacts, and the city's strategies to increase resilience to these hazards. Item 950, accept the progress reports on the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan for 2020, 2021, and 2022. Item 951, authorize application to Federal Emergency Management Agency for building resilient infrastructure and communities grant to increase disaster resilience through project planning, solar microgrid construction, and tree planting in the amount of $7,200,000. All right, great, thank you. And I've got some introductory remarks on these items before handing it off to our presenters to take this from here. I just want colleagues to be aware that this is a resolution, a report, and a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. So first of all, with regard to item 949, the city's mitigation action plan acts as our guiding strategy to reduce disaster risk over time. In order to remain in compliance with federal regulations, the city is required to undergo a comprehensive update to our natural hazard mitigation plan every five years. Item 950, accepting the progress reports on the national mitigation, or excuse me, the natural hazard mitigation plan. This report completes an administrative requirement for the city of Portland to continue participating in FEMA's community rating system. This system rewards communities like ours for going above the minimum standards of the National Flood Insurance Program and provides discounted flood insurance rates to property owners. And finally, item 951, uh, authorization of an application to FEMA BRIC grant. This ordinance authorizes the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management to apply for three grants totaling $7,200,000 to fund various priority projects within the Mitigation Action Plan and the city's climate emergency declaration. According to FEMA, for every $1 spent on natural hazard mitigation, we save about $6 in response and recovery. The proposed hazard mitigation project brings together multiple bureaus and community partners to plan and carry out the work to better protect our community, especially those who are disproportionately impacted by disaster. Jana Papanathan, Jana Papanathamiu, Chief Resilience Officer when the port, within the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, and Beth Gilden with Portland State University's Institute for Sustainable Solutions have joined us today to provide a greater context on these items. Welcome, Jana and Beth. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. For the record, I am Jana Popeff Demiu. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer at the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management. And I am sorry that Beth Gilden will not be joining us today. She went into labor this morning. It's a boy. Okay. I'm super oh, happy for her. It was a couple weeks yeah, early. That's great. Uh, but so, uh, so I'm afraid it'll just be me today. Um, can you pull up the slides? Or There they are. Awesome. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Although uh, Beth isn't here, I want to start by thanking her and her colleagues at Portland State University for their partnership in developing this plan. Um, the Bureau of Emergency Management is a small bureau. We have just two full-time uh, planners, and this is a big project for us to undertake on our own. Um, working with Portland State really added capacity for us um, to, and expanded our ability to to do this in a good way. Um, in the past, we've worked with private, like for-profit and consulting companies to update our plan. And we found that working with PSU, they really brought a lot of local knowledge to the work. Um, that We had shared values around equity that we haven't always found in um, private consultants. And uh, we really got a great bang for a buck in terms of um, the expertise at Portland State University with many professors in geology, engineering, and other fields contributing um, to our risk assessment. And also the opportunity to work with a diverse group of graduate students, particularly on the public outreach. So I, I, this is a partnership that has had great value for us, and I'm grateful, and we will look to continue it with future planning projects. Next slide, please. Wait, I have to stop you. So okay. as a former uh, 
development director <laughs> at PSU. I, that should be in there uh, when they have do their Simon Benson dinner. Like, you should be a clip. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. That's kind of you. They, they've really been rock stars. It's true. Um, I also want to thank the steering committee um, that participated. Ten bureaus participated in this uh, planning effort, and uh, many bureaus sent more than one staff person. It was a year-long engagement. We met every month. There was a lot of reading. Um, and uh, emergency management is one of those things that's a coalition of the willing at the city. So everyone that participated did it in addition to their regular work. And I was very grateful for their contributions. And also particularly, I want to call out that Clackamas County and Multnomah County both also participated in the full planning process um, to help us uh, ensure that we were uh, together building a strategy that really worked for the region and that was building on the efforts happening around us. So that was generous of them. Thanks. Uh, next slide. I'm sorry, why Clackamas County? Is it uh, Bull Run or? Uh, we, uh, Bull Run and um, Johnson Creek is a shared watershed there. And also uh, we've traded mutual aid in terms of wildfire response and smoke. And so um, so they participated Thanks. too. Sure. Um, so uh, what do we do? Uh, what, we developed this plan. Um, and uh, it, I'm going to talk today about the purpose of the plan. Um, the, I'm going to summarize the hazards that we're planning for, um, the process that we followed, and then just some highlights of the projects that were a result of that, and then, um, and then talk about next steps in implementing it. Um, if you have any questions, I invite you to just um, go ahead and ask them as we move through it so we don't have to go backwards when we get to the end. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So in terms of the purpose of the plan, um, it is uh, most of all to systematically assess the risk that we face. We know as, um, as individuals, people tend to worry too much about sharks and tornadoes and <laughs> things that probably are not, they're not enough about hypertension and use of seatbelts, which are things that you know really threaten us. Um, but collectively, we want to be smarter um, and be as much as we can. Um, a statistical in our analysis of the risks that we face and systematic in our strategy to reduce those risks. So that's a foundation of our plan. Um, the other thing that I would say is a foundation of the Portland's plan in particular and that helps us stand out from the, the other work across the United States is that we really seek to um, acknowledge and incorporate considerations of the disparate impacts of hazards across the community. We know that they don't hit all communities the same and that has to be a foundation of how we assess the risk and how we work to address it. Um, and then finally, I think that almost uh, doesn't need to be said, but to be really straightforward, we need this plan to get money from FEMA for emergency response and for hazard mitigation grants. And so um, that's an important reason that we keep it up to date and have since 2004. And um, I, this plan has already was submitted to FEMA earlier this year, and they've approved that it meets their guidance uh, once it's adopted by council. Thank you. Next slide. So I want to talk just uh, briefly about the disparate impacts of disasters, um, because what we saw during, um, during the pandemic and what we consistently see in our country is that disasters work in, worsen existing economic inequalities. And we can imagine all the reasons that that would be true, lack of insurance, lack of savings, not having a family safety net. Um, difficulty navigating the immense federal bureaucracy that is required to get disaster aid mean that um, that some communities are uh, much greater ability to recover after a disaster than others. And this phenomenon is well understood and publish uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Services services, a social vulnerability index that incorporates those factors that contribute to disparate um, risk um, that includes poverty and employment, um, education, um, age, ability, race, language, and uh, whether you, what housing type you live in and whether you have access to your own transportation. So we use that, it's called the, the SOVI index, and we use that to uh, understand our risks. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, sorry, that's fuzzy. Um, this is a map of the social vulnerability for Portland as mapped by Health and Human Services. And um, I'm sorry, it's probably, there's not much, uh, in some ways that's surprising in this map because what we see is that areas east of 82nd um, have in general heightened um, disaster risk. North Portland has heightened risk and also some close in neighborhoods that have a lot of multifamily housing with seniors and um, people that are low income also have more risk in disaster. Thank you, next slide. 
So this is, uh, now we're gonna talk about the hazards that we plan for. Um, I hope this uh, won't be scary, but it is serious. Um, this is where we really say like, so what's the worst that could happen? And how likely is that really? Um, and if it did happen, who would be most impacted? And then what are our best overall strategies to address those risks? And we'll start with the big one. Next slide, please. It's the earthquake. Yes, it is the earthquake. Um, I think that um, the community and certainly council know that the Cascadia subduction zone off the coast of uh, Oregon means uh, we're at risk for a big earthquake. Um, a magnitude eight earthquake is between 16 and 22% likely here in the next 50 years. So the one in five chance if you're in Portland in the next 50 years, you will experience it. It's 100% likely that it will happen eventually. Um, and when it does, it will severely damage our physical environment, um, our community and our economy. Um, Eco Northwest did a great study about three years ago and said depending on the time of year when it happens and the degree of shaking, it'd be 20, between 26 and 39 trillion dollars in losses. We could see 15,000 inju injuries and it would really cripple our transportation and all our utilities, power, water, everything would go dark for a little bit. Um, the impacts would be felt across the city um, and uh, it would really be um, the toughest challenge that we would all face, I think, in Portland. Um, we spend a lot of time at the Bureau of Emergency Management thinking about response strategies. Um, I, many folks probably know like, our great neighborhood emergency teams that are ready and trained to help people after an earthquake happens. Um, we do a lot of first aid classes. All first responders in Portland have plans in place to respond to an earthquake. But in terms of how we mitigate the earthquake, how we reduce the impacts of it before it happens, there are two main strategies, and one is seismic retrofitting for our buildings and infrastructure to harden it so that it will be less harmed during an earthquake. And the second strategy is about earthquake early warning. Um, to use the early warning system that's now in place um, to do things like turn off industrial processes and stop public transportation so that fewer people will be harmed uh, at the time that the earthquake occurs. Next slide, please. So this is a map of um, social vulnerability and supervised, uh, superimposed is earthquake uh, liquefaction risk. So liquefaction is what happens um, in areas that have a high water table and sort of sedimentary soils. When an earthquake happens, their soil turns to jelly and it really imp amplifies the shaking. So places with liquefaction um, experience more uh, structural damage than other parts of the city. And what we see is that um, Downtown and the Columbia Corridor the industrial area would be really impacted, so that speaks to economic impacts. Um, and also would impact uh, the Linton area and all the fuel farms there, which would have tremendous impacts um, on our access to the fuel and our ability to use equipment to recover. So there, those are risks that are further described in the plan. Next slide, please. All right, moving through all the big ones, flood. Um, when we speak about flood, we usually look at the 100-year flood, which is a flood that has a 1% chance of recurrence uh, in any given year. Um, our estimation of the 100-year flood is based on historic data, but we know our t climate is changing. And so what is now 100-year flood may become a 20-year flood um, in, in the coming decades. Um, about 1.3% of Portland's buildings are actually in a floodplain, so they will flood during a 100-year flood. Um, and that risk is, uh, as I said, it's increasing. The good news is floods here are generally predictable. Um, the Willamette River and the Columbia River are huge river systems um, that stretch all the way to Canada and to the Rocky Mountains, um, and we're kind of at the end of the line, and so we can see that flood coming days and sometimes a week ahead. If we're doing our job in emergency management, uh, fatalities should be extremely rare in flooding. Um, but pro the potential for property damage is huge. Um, and uh, and, and it, it, the similar places that experience uh, liquefaction risk, we'll look at that map, also are at risk for flood damage. Um, I think it's also worth noting, um, although it's a topic that I think the council will delve into separately, is that um, there are levees in the city of Portland and upstream in the system that are uh, inadequate by the, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and that's a, a lot of work has been done and we'll need to continue to address that risk. 
Um, in terms of mitigation strategies, a strategy that has already had great success in Portland is floodplain restoration, and we see that along Johnson Creek, um, where the Bureau of Environmental Services has led um, floodplain restoration projects that have reduced flooding on Foster Road and re reduced basement flooding for people that live in those neighborhoods. That's a success story. Um, we also need to strengthen our levees and the other infrastructure that is located, um, that is necessarily located in flood prone areas, our pump stations and things like that. And those projects are in the plan. Uh, next map, please. Or next slide, please. It's a map. That shows the 100 and 500 year floodplains. And it's really sobering. If you look at historic maps of Portland, you'll see that so much of, uh, of our industrial areas are former floodplains and really um, face those risks. Next slide, please. Severe heat. Uh, heat is um, the most deadly hazard in the United States and in the most deadly hazard that's addressed in our plan. It's a silent killer um, and it's one that is increasing quickly the, with climate change across the country and in Portland. Portland is not, uh, it has historically a, a moderate climate. It's Las Vegas, Miami, Tucson. There are a lot of American cities that have a lot of experience with heat. Um, but because our climate is changing so fast, our buildings and our infrastructure here in Portland are not designed for the climate that, that, is, that is coming. And so for that reason, we have seen tremendous impacts from severe heat. Um, it most impacts people that are socially isolated and don't have air conditioning. Um, it, it harms people with underlying conditions. We can imagine the communities that are most impacted. We haven't talked a lot about how it harms businesses, but anecdotally, I think we also see that as the weather gets hotter, small businesses um, are really impacted by it. A lot of small businesses close when it's super hot, or they see their pass by traffic go way down. And also, people that work outside, they have to face a choice between putting their health at risk and not working. So the impact, the financial impacts of heat are serious too. And heat is not a hazard that falls equally across the city. Um, because of patterns of urban development, neighborhoods that have a lot of tree canopy um, can stay relatively cool even on the hottest days where a neighborhood that has a lot of uh, freeways and parking lots would be up to 17 degrees hotter on a hot day. Um, so that's a big difference. Our best mitigation strategies are to reduce that heat island effect through tree planting. Um, to increase the number of residences with air conditioning through giveaways or subsidies, um, to require landlords to ensure that residences or at least a room in a resident maintains a, a maximum temperature in the heat, and then for folks that don't have another place to go to increase the public locations that have air conditioning, um, like community centers. And then a good strategy for heat and all the hazards that I'm going to talk about after this are what we call our all hazard strategy that is about improving public communication and awareness of risk and strengthening social safety nets. So we'll never be able to knock on every person's door and make sure they're okay when it's really hot, but a strategy that says everybody needs somebody to check on, everybody needs somebody to check on them can help us make us safe for heat and a lot of other hazards. Next slide, please. So this is, oh, I'm so sorry, the slides are not as crisp as they, I would like them to be. But um, you can see this really shows um, how the forested areas of the city stay a lot cooler uh, and other parts with more intense development are get hotter. Um, and also the neighborhoods where we see those, particularly folks over 65 who live alone, that's kind of our target demographic for heat safety and risk. Next slide, please. Right. Yeah, Can please. I pause here? Um, uh, let's flip back, back to the map, please. Oh, different oh, map. Uh, oh, that's forward, I think. Yep, there. There we go. There we go. Um, I'm intrigued by the um, neighborhoods marked with uh, your Very high. Very high. Um, is that because of the infrastructure in those neighborhoods, or is that just in... An idiosyncratic thing. Uh, um, in terms of, uh, so the very high is for what we would say the socially isolated population, so people who are 65 oh, plus I, and living I alone. See, Does see, that make I, sense? So it's like a yeah, concentration yeah, 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 of affordable uh, housing is a, a lot of it. Thank you. I read that wrong. Oh, no, that's for sure. It's Again, I'm super sorry it didn't look so fuzzy in my little last screen. Next slide, please. Oh, wildfire and smoke. Um, We've had a lot of experience with this in the last few years also, unfortunately. 
Um, the West has always um, had fire as a natural part of the ecology, um, but um, fire is increasing with climate change. And there are many natural areas within the city of Portland that are considered um, fire prone. And m more than 8,000 residences and billions of dollars of um, property that are in those areas are very close to them. Um, as the fire season gets longer and more frequent, we see more intense fires and greater risk here in the city. Um, we also see a lot more wildfire smoke impacts from other parts of the state and even other states or other parts of the West. Um, like heat, this is a hazard that disproportionately harms people who are seniors, people with undergoing conditions, and people who don't have AC to filter the air at their house. Um, our mitigation strategies for fire are maintenance of natural areas, um, including controlled burns. There's a cool project in the plan around sort of um, uh, using indigenous land practices uh, to do more controlled burns uh, to reduce fuel risk. Um, we also really have to maintain our fire roads because that's how we get to a start in the park really quick and get it out before it grows. Um, we also need to be in partnership with property owners around their landscaping and material selection to have uh, houses that are easier to defend from fire. And then for people who don't have a safe place to go in their house, um, improving HVAC systems in public buildings so that people can get respite in places like community centers is also important. And the HVAC improvement has a lot of improvements uh, for a pandemic too, as we've seen. So it's a, um, a strategy that helps us in a lot of ways. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This shows the neighborhoods that have the greatest wildfire, direct risk from wildfire, wildfire smoke um, uh, it, more evenly across the city. But for wildfire hazard, it's kind of the inverse of that heat map. So those neighborhoods that have a lot of trees are, are cooler, but they have uh, their own thing to worry about. Next slide, please. Landslide. So uh, landslide is probably the hazard that we spend the least time thinking about, I think. Um, in a way, it's good because uh, it's, fatalities from landslides are really rare. Um, but it's also the, um, the hazard that's probably the most likely. It's 100% likely that we will see landslides in Portland every year. It's a natural part of our ecology because of our topography and rainfall. Um, BDS estimates there's at least 20 landslides that happen a year that come to their attention, and they probably cause at least a million dollars in private property damage every year. So it's a costly hazard. Um, most of it's covered by private insurance, or, or individuals have to pay to fix their own houses, and so the cost doesn't fall to the city. But one big landslide that blocks Burnside uh, or uh, damages a big pipe that's buried can have a big cost to the city and huge disruptions if you imagine a road being closed for a month or more. Um, our best mitigation strategies are hardening our key routes like Burnside to prevent landslide damage, um, preventing additional development in, late, in areas that have very high landslide risk, and then working with property owners so that they're managing stormwater appropriately and when they see something that looks like it's changing, that they engage an engineer and work with the city right away before the problem gets worse. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is the map of landslide hazards, and predictably, uh, the steeper the topography, the more likely you, you are to see uh, landslide risk. Mm, next slide, please. Winter storms. Finally, a problem that's getting better. <laughs> Could you go back to the last yes, one sure, for a sure. sec? The last slide. Uh, the landslide map? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We, we have this great information about the landslide hazard um, yep. risk areas. <clears throat> is it PBOT who m monitors this frequently during? Great during, question. Yeah. There's, a, um, there's a fantastic structural engineer at the Bureau of Development Services named Erica Koss, and she heads the city landslide committee, which meets monthly. And we actually, uh, we look at uh, active slides kind of together, uh, PBOT there, parks there, water there, BES is there, emergency management, fire. Um, and we look at the status of active landslides that are known and kind of talk about, oh, this, could this block a fire emergency route or are you working with the property owner or how does this impact yeah. parts and talk it through. Yeah. So we have a system. We have a system. It's, uh, it's another coalition of the willing, but yeah. so far it feels like and, it works And hearing well. that it's multiple bureaus, that made me happy. And when we're having extreme rainfall, do they meet more frequently? They do meet more frequently, and we get email alerts from Erica when uh, it, it's still a little early in the season, but okay. as the ground becomes saturated, she monitors soil moisture, so she lets us know when it seems like the, 
the land has absorbed all the water right. it can and it's going to start to slide. All right, comforted now. Thanks. It, can, let me jump in here with a quick question. Um, I'm trying to understand where these geographic breakdowns come from. Maybe I'm asking, what does RRA stand for? Oh, where do you see it? Um, oh. City. Yeah, right there. RRA. I, City of Portland, RRA. I wish, oh gosh, I'm blanking on that. It's, we grouped, we started out trying, I'll just maybe tell you how right. we got to this. We started out trying to do every neighborhood, because we know people think about the city like in their right, neighborhood right. and they want to look at, and then you couldn't read any of the maps. And so we grouped the neighborhoods together in residential areas. I'm sorry, I don't know. But that's what they came up with was trying to group it so people would still kind of look and say, like, oh, I live in East or Southeast. They could find themselves. Okay. And that was my, well, basically what I was trying to figure out. Is <laughs> right. if FEMA has div kind of divided the city up this way or no, no, this staff, is, this, this is something just staff, staff did. did to try and help people orient themselves. Okay. And it's for, and we divided it up this way largely just to make it easy to read the map as to make, opposed to, to make service easy. delivery. Totally. Okay. It, it does follow geographic like neighborhood boundaries. So it's, uh, but um, uh, yeah. Got it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. All right. Landslides are uh, another one because it's caused by rain. They're increasing with climate change. But next slide. One hazard that's getting better. I love it. There's one thing we'll have to worry yeah. about less in the future. Climate change is causing a lot of problems, but we will have fewer <laughs> winter storms uh, someday. Uh, we'll have more winter, I know, uh, we'll have more atmospheric rivers and rain and landslides and floods, but, uh, you know, at least uh, we'll ha we can have uh, less outdoor deaths, I hope. Um, because right now, winter storms are actually the second deadliest hazard in Portland. Um, we know 11 people have perished from hypothermia during winter, severe cold in the last 10 years. That's probably a big undercount because it's uh, a community that experiences that as houseless and it's very hard to track. Um, but ice and snow also causes property damage, it's inconvenient, your internet goes out, it gets dark. Um, so it's, this is a, a hazard that we think about and address in most years. Um, because it's a hazard that's improving, uh, our main strategies for it are all hazard approaches that improve public communication, social safety nets, at that same thing, that check on your neighbor, make sure someone will check on you is the best way that we have to keep people safe in winter storms. Um, and then also increasing access to emergency shelters, um, which can also serve as for severe heat and smoke and other events. Can I ask a question on this? Yep. Um, are we sure winter storms are becoming less frequent? I, in, recent, in recent years, it seems like we got a lot of snow. And uh, sometimes <laughs> I, I think that we can have global warming, which is a common thing, which is the notion things are just getting warmer. Okay. I think another um, frame to think about climate change is that the climate and, or the weather becomes just more variable. Climate disruption, totally. Right. In the in the medium to long term, I feel confident the winters are going to get warmer. But I think what we are experiencing now, perhaps, is because of climate disruption, the weather's harder to predict. So we had the hottest October on record, and then November 2nd, I thought I was going to have to go down and open a community center to be a winter weather shelter. That, that strangeness of the weather it, it increases risk. And also, in the transition, we um, there's a lot of models that say we're still going to get winter snow, but then we're also going to have more um, atmospheric rivers. And that's like where we get the worst flooding, is when you get the snow and then the rain, big rain on snow events that melted all at once. It kind of doubles the rainfall. And so um, so in the transition, you're right, this unpredictability makes winter weather harder to manage. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Sure. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right, then we kind of get to the black swan events. Uh, <laughs> these are the high impact, but low probability volcanic eruption. Um, I'm old enough to remember the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, which actually killed 57 people. Um, it was the worst volcanic disaster in the history of the United States. Um, so it's, it's a considered a high threat volcano, although you know it doesn't happen suddenly. Um, we also can see extra tropical cyclones. They have occasionally reached Portland. I don't quite remember the Columbus Day storm of 1962, but that killed 47 people and had 116 mile an hour winds on the Morrison Bridge in the middle of the day. It was a it, if we classified it in our modern system, it was a Category Four hurricane that hit Portland. And this is the kind of storm that we could see again in our lifetimes, especially with climate change. 
Um, so these are sort of less likely events that we still incorporate into our planning. Um, but uh, for efficiency, you know, no volcano shelters. We approach an all hazard strategy that it, again comes back to that communication and social safety nets that people know what's going on and they check on each other. And that I think is it concludes our hazards. Next slide, please. Any uh, last questions on kind of the risks that we're planning for before we talk about the process? No, okay, that was the hard part. That was everything that could go wrong. Um, <laughs> let's now talk about the plan process. I'm just gonna give you a short timeline and be straightforward. This is a project that got really dragged out because of COVID. Um, we got the grant at the end of 2019 and we intended to kick off at the beginning of 2020, uh, but all the resources of my Bureau of Emergency Management were redirected towards pandemic response. And so we didn't start the project until that fall and the committee started meeting in January, 2021. Um, we uh, met through the spring and to develop the hazard assessments in partnership with PSU and kind of create a framework for plans. And then before we did a lot of work to develop new strategies, we went to the community outreach portion to get community voice into those strategies. We did that over the summer. Um, and then uh, we came back in the fall to refine the projects using that lens. And we finished the fall, uh, the plan in the winter of 2021. Um, it, we submitted it in the spring and it's taken it more than six months to wend its way through the federal bureaucracy and come back to us uh, ready for our adoption and that brings us to where we are right now. Can I ask a clarifying question? Please. Um, so is this our first uh, natural hazard mitigation plan? Do oh. we do this every year, every Ooh, five years? I'm glad years? you asked. No, I, I should have made that more clear. It is our fourth natural hazard mitigation plan. Uh, our first one was adopted in 2004 and we update it about every five years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about the community engagement on this plan. Um, community engagement and community voice was important in this plan, particularly because of the need to ground it in service to communities that are historically and currently underserved by government. Um, and at the same time, the uh, circumstances made it challenging to do sort of traditional community engagement at this time. Uh, we were still in a pandemic on uh, another COVID surge, and so um, people weren't meeting together in person indoors. Um, and also uh, there was a robust dialogue on racial justice uh, that was really overtaking, a, driving a lot of conversations, particularly with government at that time. And so that was a theme in, uh, in all our engagement. Um, I think that in some ways it drove us to do uh, better community engagement that we've done in the past. It was definitely different, but we were really looking to get feedback that was authentic, that respected people's time and did not ask communities to repeat themselves, um, to tell us things they told us before, um, or to do work for us, to come to extra meetings and fill out surveys, uh, you know, to, f to answer questions we could figure out for ourselves, but really invited people to share in an open-ended way about their priorities about, um, about risk and hazard reduction. Um, so to not have people repeat themselves, we started um, with um, findings we had made in the year before um, as part of community outreach. We did um, surveys in black barbershops um, and asked people, what do you worry about? What have you done at home to be safe from those hazards? And how do you feel your city can best support you and your community to be resilient? Um, we also did paid focus groups with VOS, Apano, and Latino Network and asked very similar questions. So the responses to those focus groups were a foundation of the projects that we developed in the plan. Um, at the time we were doing this work, we were also very engaged with an, about 80 community-based organizations um, that were helping us to do the work of pandemic response. So we're distributing food boxes and doing COVID testing, things like that. And we were meeting with a lot of those organizations every week. And so we used those engagements to do focused interviews and small, uh, small focus groups with community-based organizations um, to ask them how we could work together in future and what they saw as community needs for other kinds of disasters. About 40 CBOs participated in those informal interviews. Then we know not everyone is represented by a group, not everybody's a joiner. Um, and so we also did direct outreach to community um, at parks lunch and play events, which were a fantastic place for us to meet people outside um, and in a place they were gonna come anyways. And where we knew we were gonna reach a lot of community members that were low income or food insecure, which is a huge flag for um, 
uh, disaster risk for other kinds of emergencies. So it's a great uh, community for us to engage with. Um, and then, of course, we want to uh, hold the door open for everyone, so we also put all the materials on the website. We did email to our interested parties list and invited comments that way. And next slide, please. And that led us to um, this, this chapter in the uh, plan about community voice. Um, the synthesizing community voice is challenging uh, because we had a lot of varied engagement opportunities. They happened over time, and we asked really open-ended questions. Um, and I don't, and I feel very hum humble to say I would speak for for the diverse communities of Portland. But I do want to share, um, highlight the themes that came across to our, uh, myself and the researchers at PSU coming out of all this work. Um, in the first thing we saw that was that all residents, including um, low-income residents, people who don't have a lot of re resources, they know about earthquakes and they worry about them. Um, and they also are worry about the impacts of climate change on their own lives, about heat and smoke and fires. Um, and communities that have fewer resources are ke keenly aware that their lack of money or space to store things in their house are, are barriers to them being as prepared as others. And that also adds to their concern about hazards. Um, at the same time, just as um, increased disaster risk is a result of other disparities in the community, efforts to increase community resilience need to tie to other efforts to improve services and quality of life for those communities. Um, projects around transportation access, energy efficiency, improving public facilities, um, communities saw those as having a lot of value. And expensive sort of standalone projects don't make any sense to, to communities, and I don't think you'll see them in this plan. Instead, we were really looking for strategies that have good co-benefits, that benefit people in blue skies as well as dark skies, and that those are the, those are the strategies that communities really want to see move forward. I was also encouraged that um, community-based organizations felt like the partnership and emergency response was effective, um, and they wanted to see those continue um, and be partners in implementation of future hazard mitigation projects. Um, and then um, communities, I think, uh, they have realistic expectations for us. They, uh, they didn't think the government was going to come and solve all their problems and bring them chocolate bars and toilet paper after the earthquake. Uh, but rather, um, they had a desire for information and support to prepare at home and to be ready to support members of their own community in a disaster. So I think you'll see that reflected in our plan in the education and outreach elements of it. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where we give an overview of the projects that we came up with. Um, we're almost to the end. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the project has 115 projects. I will s spare you 115 additional slides. Um, but I want to um, highlight that the kinds of projects were there. There was a lot of infrastructure projects where we know what we need to build or fix or strengthen. Um, there was also uh, some. Uh, about 10 natural systems projects. All of them are pretty big, I would say, like tree planting, floodplain restoration. So those are small projects with a big reach. Um, there are also um, plans around plans and regulations. And I want to say the planning part uh, more when we come to what bureaus want to do planning. Um, and then education projects that I said, that those were a priority for community. Um, eight bureaus brought forward um, projects, and then there were nine projects that were um, jointly proposed by multiple bureaus. I think it's interesting to see which bureaus propose projects in part because it uh, reflects um, their investment in asset management and in planning and really in their capacity to do that work. So a bureau like Water that's a leader in asset management, it doesn't have all the resources it needs to do the projects, but it knows the work that it needs to do, right? It has a good conditions assessment. It knows where their facilities are at and what, what needs to be done, where bureaus like Parks and Peabot equally face huge challenges from disaster risk, but they were more likely to bring for a few projects or a project that said, we need to, we need to plan for what to do, because they don't have shovel-ready projects that also has a cost to develop them. So I thought that was interesting, and I wanted to um, just share that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I want to tell you today about three priority projects. Donna, yes. Go back the last slide. Sure. <clears throat> The multi-bureau projects, were mm -hmm. there nine? Yes. <clears throat> is that different than in the past when Kishin Maps asked, is, this, is a, this happens every how many years? Every five years. Okay. Yeah, we haven't in the past brought forward many multi-bureau projects. And I'm hopeful, I mean, fundamentally, sort of almost every project should be a multi-bureau project, right? right? I'm surprised how, <laughs> that the number's so low. Um, these are, pro 
there, there are, it makes sense to me. So Water Bureau says we need to harden this pump station because it's in a flood prone area and it doesn't have good, and we're like, okay, that's a water project, go and do that. But um, a lot of them are, um, a, a lot of the, a lot of the big projects are jointly improving stormwater at the same time we build resilient power in a facility that belongs to parks, right? Like those are the best projects, um, and uh, and and I'm hopeful that uh, that as we continue to do this work as a coalition, that th that number will grow. Thanks. Thank you. Next slide, please. So I want to highlight three priority projects, and I'm, uh, we, I'm asking for permission to apply for money to do them. Um, <laughs> the first one is for tree planting in East Portland. Um, this is a plan that, uh, that's for heat mitigation. It reduces the heat island effect, so it's a climate-driven risk. Um, it's a, obviously, it's led by Portland Parks and Recreation uh, Forestry. Um, and I think this is a great project because uh, for a couple reasons. One, tree planting has a ton of co-benefits, right? It reduces the heat island, but improves air quality. It slows traffic speeds. It increases property values. There's a lot of reasons that planting trees is a good investment. And it's also work that Parks is going to do anyways. So there's a 25% matching requirement here, and it's very easy for them to show a huge match on this million dollars. And so it makes it likely to be funded, and it means they know they have resources and they know how to do the work. So that's the first project. Um, the second one um, will be led by the Bureau of Transportation. And this is a great example of a bureau that knows it needs to do work but hasn't had the resources to even plan it. So it's a modest grant, it's $200,000. They, in their routine inspections of Fan Oak Creek, they see a place where road is falling into the creek and it's an emergency transportation route. Um, and they need to repair it, but before they can repair it, they need to do engineering studies, they need to fit, cost it out, they need to do environmental compliance, and then come back in a year or two with a project that will be part two will be to complete the work. And that should also be brick eligible. So I hope to come back with that project in a, 18 months or so. But right now they're looking for money to do that planning work. Um, and then the last project, the biggest one is, um, is uh, for um, solar, uh, solar increase in the number of solar panels to do some work on the electrical system and add batteries so that the East Portland Community Center can, um, can have a complete solar microgrid. Um, this East Portland Community Center is a tremendous resource for East Portland. We use it as a shelter for heat, for smoke, for cold. It's a community kitchen for, um, for Meals on Wheels, which was super important during the pandemic. And it's also um, just a place where people come and feel safe and get resources from the city. So we would like to see this have resilient power that we can rely on for outages in winter and summer and potentially that can work off-grid in an earthquake for an extended period of time. Can I ask you a question about the timing of these? Yeah. So you are applying for BRIC grants. They all have a matching requirement. Yes. Where does that come in in the budget process? Great question. The reason we brought forward these three projects in particular is because there are already funds committed to do work at East Portland Community Center to plant trees and to do some planning around um, slope stabilization. And so the idea is that these are all projects that would, um, they would, they would sort of be a force multiplier for investments we're already intending to make. Very good, thank you. Sure. So uh, this investment at the East Portland Community Center is one that um, has, uh, has a lot of community support through a different project at PSU. We've already um, talked to a lot of center users about kind of their hopes and dreams for the future of this center and it feels like this would be a good fit with other work that Parks wants to do there. Any other questions about the projects? Yeah, I have a couple of questions on, the, on this one. Um, can you tell us more about how you pick these particular projects? Uh, sure. Well, so uh, I shared the grant opportunities with the uh, the steering committee, and I asked for folks to come forward with projects that were a priority for their bureau, and that they could, frankly, that they could meet the match. Mm -hmm. Right. That's important. Um, and then the what kind of what Peben brought to the table is that we have um, we hired a grant writer. Um, so we said, if you've got the money, you can articulate the project to someone who's a professional grant writer. We will pay that person to help you get the project into the applying for federal grants is a huge amount of work. Yeah. So that will help you do the cost benefit analysis and fill out the budget forms and sort of get it over the finish line to apply. And um, is this an exercise we do every year, applying for uh, BRIC grants? We often do. Uh, I really push bureaus, uh, candidly, I push bureaus harder to apply this year because there are $2.3 billion available, which is a huge amount of money, more than in years past. So it really felt like a shame if we didn't bring forward projects. Um, 
Okay. Uh, uh, well, I'm glad to see us apply for this. I, I know, um, and ultimately when we get to voting on uh, 951, I'm going to vote yes um, on this. Um, I'll. I, I want to learn more about why um, there are no water or BES uh, grants here. I, I, I I've asked staff to kind of provide some insight into why we um, didn't pursue this more aggressively. Um, it seems like this train might have already left the station for this year. Um, but um, well, when, when does the planning for this begin for next year? Let's put it that way. I mean, I think it can start today, right? Okay. <laughs> we know, I mean, it's an annual grant, so we know it's going to come back around. I would love to. I think we haven't, uh, frankly, we haven't done, the city has not, taken advantage, uh, it's yeah. not done enough to, uh, uh, not to take, take advantage, to avail ourselves of the resources that are available to do the work. Yeah. I totally and, agree. And I, 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 to be fair here, I think um, applying for these grants uh, perhaps has not historically been part of the culture over in water or environmental services, but I've asked um, my uh, colleagues over in water and BES to take a look at that instinct and um, maybe we can do something different next year. Um, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So, okay, this is uh, I want it. Mm, this is a administrative requirement, and we're almost to the end. But I want to give you like thirty seconds because this is actually another really cool project that the city does. The community rating system is uh, like a voluntary participation to demonstrate to FEMA how what we're doing to reduce flood risk, and when we participate in that program. The reason we do is because the National Flood Insurance Program will give a discount to homeowners if the city participates. And right now, we're saving Portland residents, homeowners, about $600,000 annually in, uh, through our participation. And most of the people who benefit live in Lentz along Johnson Creek. So it's, a, a, in general, a demographic that can, could use the extra cash in their pocket. Um, BS does a lot of the work on this, and I know the person who does it is another project they took on to the side of their desk because it, it was important to the community and they wanted to make time for it, and I help, and BDS helps. A lot of bureaus have contributed to this, so it's also a place where we're kind of making that coalition. Um, there are three reports in here. We haven't done reports for three years. Yes, sir, that is shameful. Uh, we got a little busy with COVID, um, and the CRS program was, had, gave us a ton of grace and said that when we updated our plan, we could turn them all in at once. So I'm bringing the reports to you uh, today, and they're, um, they're all in the, the packet. But we do community education, we exercise a plan, we keep our contact list up to date, and we you know, are responsible, I think, in managing the floodplain. Um. Can you give us a just a quick, like sixty second over or sixty second overview of of maybe our most recent report? I I, I kind of skimmed this and it looked to me like it was a little bit of a progress report on how well we're doing on our climate, our emergency man or our resilience plans. Um, how are we doing on our resilience plans? I think we're doing well, and I'm happy to give a summary, but I'm looking because I think um, that someone from BS might have joined the meeting. I can't see if they're here. Yes, Amin Wahab, is he here? Amin, do you want to, Amin wrote the report, yeah, so. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry to, okay. to pressure you. How many more slides do you have? Because I'm going to have to leave eventually, and I want to make sure I can be here for the vote. Certainly. I think I, this is the one more slide. Very good. All right, thank you. Sure. Uh, is, um, Amin, do you want to answer the question about the reports? He wrote them, so I want to let him speak to them. And he's been waiting since two. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, John, this is Amin uh, Wahab, I'm with BES. Um, uh, I actually, this was, uh, this year's report is pretty, um, uh, kind of, it, it doesn't have a lot of details, and the reason for that is that because, you know, the mitigation action plan, the new one was um, going through the approval process, and, uh, and we will have, you know, a lot more details in it next year when we come to you. Um, and uh, right now, I just went through a review of the, the spreadsheet there's like 115 of those um actions listed in there and, and we basically have made you know progress you know on all of them even though they're not listed in the in this year's report um we can provide the details um if the commissioner would like to, uh, to have more details we'll be more than happy to kind of provide details on that and also on our resiliency planning here within bes 
And today's not the time to unpack it. I took a quick skim through there. And one of the things that jumped out at me is it seems like pretty consistently over the last several years, for about 30% of our projects, we're not making progress on or not making significant progress on. I'm, I have, um, I'm curious to see how concerned we should be around that. I'm glad you asked. I, something, I, an approach we tried to take this year was actually to reduce the, we kind of had a laundry list of projects before it was aspirational and people threw in some projects that were kind of like that volcano shelter, yeah. you know, the thing that was like, that's never going to be the best use of resources. And so we really tried to weed those out this year, but I, I'm hopeful that those 30% of projects were just like, weren't a great use of money. Okay. Uh, um, I appreciate that. And we'll have more opportunities to explore the space. And uh, thanks, Amin. I appreciate you being here since too. I look forward to talking about it more. We're almost done. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, in summary, what's the best part about the work? Um, bureaus work together. Uh, it's a coalition of the willing. Uh, I, I think that's a direction the city wants to go. We're doing it. And we've been grateful that, um, that the county's actually been an awesome partner in it. And the Port of Portland wants to come along next year. Um, we want to right size our community engagement. So we're asking people to give input and spend time on our work to the extent that it's also a benefit to them. Um, and that the communities that face the greatest risks are at the center of that engagement. And when we do those things and we end up with projects that are a good use of money and they have broad support and FEMA will fund them. And that's my hope uh, for the projects I showed you today. And that, uh, that's it. Um, I, turn it back, uh, I turn it back to you, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, to the, I, we need to vote on the items and unless there's other questions, yeah, I'm and done. We, we also have to see, is there a public testimony on any of these items? No one signed up. Very good. Um, colleagues, any further questions for Jana? Commissioner Ryan? Yeah, before the, are we going to vote on all of them at the same time? We are going to uh, vote on the resolution and the report and the ordinance is a first reading. Okay. I, because of the, uh, it, the, that we passed in Congress, the big infrastructure bill, uh, you're working with government relations, correct? We, am. Yeah, okay. we are, and they'll help us get support letters and move the projects Great. forward. So the, the grant numbers that we're seeing today should be much larger in the future. I hope so, that. yes. Okay, great. Very good. To the resolution item 949, any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. I want to thank uh, PBIM for all the work that they've done, um, on both on these projects and for the city over the past several years. It's been a remarkable and, frankly, um, traumatic um, run that we've been on. I'm really glad to see the planning work that we've done here. Um, and I also look forward to digging in um, more deeply to make sure that we can kind of strengthen and bolster our attempts to be resilient. Um, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I just want to thank Donna for the presentation. It was very thorough. I learned a lot in this and um, it's just great to get that update. And it just feels very community centered and uh, very clear about the direction you're going. And um, I look forward to seeing the results of the um, grant applications and, and hearing update on the work. I vote aye. Ryan. Jonna, thank you so much for this presentation. I always feel bad for people that present uh, at, after 4 o'clock, after we've had <laughs> meetings since 9.30. And um, this is so important, and we needed to uh, be in this presentation with you and be present. And I think all of us know that we have follow-up work to do with our bureaus. I vote aye. Wheeler. Well, I'd like to extend my thanks as well, and I want to take a moment to really acknowledge the great work of our emergency management staff to uh, not only develop, but really think thoroughly about how to implement these various proposals. And I also appreciate the leverage that you're trying to bring to the grants. Thank you. I, I think that's, that's always appreciated. Uh, and uh, like Commissioner Rubio, I feel like you've taken the extra efforts here to really live out our core values, especially those around fiscal responsibility as well as equity and collaboration with our community partners. That seems to shine through very, very brightly here. And I want to acknowledge and appreciate that. Uh, I vote aye. The resolution is adopted. To the report, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can second. Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Any further discussion on the report? Item number 950. Seeing none, please call the roll.
Maps. Um, at some point at a future briefing, I'd like to learn more about um, these particular reports. I'm hoping these can be tools that allow us to evaluate how well we're doing in terms of implementing our um, emergency management resilient plans. I'm not sure if that's what these reports actually do for us, though. Um, but I, I look at this also as an opportunity to uh, begin to do some thinking about how um, we add um, we bring in asset management and some form of risk management to um, preparing for natural disasters. For these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The report's accepted. Before I move 951 to second reading, any further comments by any of my colleagues? Uh, moving, for, move, moving forward, um, and I'll say this to whoever is in charge of um, water and environmental services. I sure hope to see water and environmental services apply for some of these uh, FEMA brick dollars um, in future funding cycles. As subtle as can be. Well done. <laughs> Very well done. That's the last word. Item 951 is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. And colleagues, long day, but a productive one. We are adjourned. Thank you.